Now, it's been a long time since there was a supernova in the Milky Way. Over 400 years, to be precise. So hey, we're long overdue. So here are the most likely stars to go boom, if they haven't already. At the top of the list must be the Southern Hemisphere's star, Eta Carini. Greek letters before the name of the constellation indicate the rank of the star's brightness in that constellation. Sir Edmund Halley, in 1677, recorded Eta Carini as the seventh brightest star in the constellation Carina, Eta being the seventh letter in the Greek alphabet. It might not have looked very bright to Sir Edmund and his contemporaries in the 17th century, but modern studies of Eta Carini estimate it's 5 million times more luminous than our Sun. Luminous is a technical word astronomers use. It doesn't just mean brightness. Luminosity refers to the total energy released at all frequencies. Eta Carine releases 5 million times more energy than the Sun. Truly one of the whoppers of the Milky Way, Eta Carine is 100 times more massive and 240 times larger than our yellow-white dwarf sun, Sol. Obviously, since it appears dim, Eta Carini is pretty far away, about 7,500 light-years away. Yet even at this distance, if this star goes hypernova, it can still impact Earth's ozone layer, disrupt satellite communications, and harm astronauts. 159 years after Halley's observation, Eta Carini experienced a nova-like explosion. It increased from a relatively dim star to become the second brightest star visible from Earth, but only for a period of 27 years. From 1836 until 1863, Eta Carini was the second brightest visible star after Sirius the dog star. And Sirius is only about 8 light years away. Since 1863, aside from a couple of flare-ups, Eta Carini has dimmed back down to its original brightness at magnitude 4.5. Now astronomers owe us a small apology, which we don't expect to get anytime soon, for star magnitude nomenclature. The brighter a star is, or planet, or moon, the lower its magnitude. Thus, stars brighter than first magnitude are either zero magnitude or negative magnitude. The full moon, for example, is magnitude negative 13. A magnitude positive 4.5 star, like Eta Carini, is quite dim as seen from Earth. But it's clearly visible in a night sky without light pollution or clouds if you live anywhere south of the latitude of Cairo, Egypt. 30 degrees north latitude is the farthest north you can see this star. Now, listen up. Eta Carine is currently up to something. It's been brightening again and is now brighter than at any time since 1864. It's a complex situation. Eta Carini is really two stars. Eta Carini A and Eta Carini, hmm, what's your guess? Oh, B. There's a third star nearby that's also interacting with the double star's dynamics. Now, without looking, I'm guessing it's named Eta Carini C. Good guess. Blown out into two incredibly massive globes of gas that are expanding at 20 million miles per hour, Eta Carini is, without a doubt, one of the strangest looking stars you'll ever see. Remember, it's located at a great distance of 7,500 light-years away from us. And if anything had happened to Eta Carine in the last 7,500 years, like going hypernova, we wouldn't be able to see it. Because none of Eta Carini's electromagnetic radiation would have gotten here yet. Astronomers are keeping a close watch on Eta Carini because it can go hypernova at any time. Or maybe it already did 5,000 years ago. In which case, we'd only have to wait another 2,500 years to see it. Yeah, like I'll put it in my planner. Now, from a list of over 30 likely candidate stars that might go supernova, Rho Cassiopeiae is many astronomers' choice. Another Greek letter, Rho, is the 17th letter in the Greek alphabet. It means that Rho Cassiopeiae is the star with the 17th brightest apparent magnitude in the constellation Cassiopeia. Yet Rho Cass, a nickname, is only one of seven known yellow hypergiant stars in the Milky Way. It's another whopper. To be seen at magnitude 4.5 from a distance of about 10,000 light years away, Rho Cass must be a very large star, a hypergiant. Placed where the Sun is, Rho Cass would encompass the orbit of Mars. But it's still yellow. It's not a red giant star. Red indicates a cooler surface temperature. 
row Cass, as huge as it is, is still as hot on its surface as our Sun, or even a little hotter. That can only mean two things. Deep inside its core, Rho Cass is fusing atoms much heavier than hydrogen or helium. Plus, Rho Cass is producing much more energy than a red giant star. In the year 2000, Rho Cass erupted massively. It brightened by two orders of magnitude as it ejected 10,000 times the mass of Earth into space at four times the speed of sound. Astronomers detected the signature of titanium oxide in this eruption. This means that Rho Cass is much closer to going supernova, or in this particular case, hypernova, than astronomers used to assume. Iron is just a few steps above titanium in the periodic table, and when iron forms, fusion stops and a star collapses. Rho Cass is really close, or more correctly, was really close. Because the eruption we saw in the year 2000 really happened 10,000 years before, Many astronomers think Rho Cass has already gone hypernova, formed a black hole, and doesn't even exist anymore. Meanwhile, Betelgeuse caught everyone's attention not so long ago. The star, not the movie. It dimmed dramatically, appearing only 37% as bright as it usually is. Is it getting ready to go supernova? Betelgeuse is by far the brightest star in the whole sky, in infrared light. This is an important fact because it relates to Betelgeuse's status as a supernova candidate, as we shall soon see. Betelgeuse is also named Alpha Orionis, another Greek letter designation. So we should conclude that Betelgeuse is the brightest star in Orion, right? Wrong. It's the second brightest star in its constellation. Rigel, or Beta Orionis, is the brightest one in that region. Yeah, figure that one out. It may be because Betelgeuse is classified as a semi-regular variable star, which sounds kind of redundant to me. Its approximately 400-day cycle of pulsation changes its brightness by about one full magnitude, going from much brighter than a first magnitude star to closer to a second magnitude star. But never was Betelgeuse observed to dim so rapidly or so drastically as it did recently. So what's going on with it? Well, from late 2019 to mid-2020, Betelgeuse went through a period of substantial dimming during a mass ejection event. The world astronomy community jumped on the situation, and in the course of their investigations, they came up with some surprising new factual data on Betelgeuse. First, Betelgeuse is not as far away as we once thought. The new, more accurate distance for Betelgeuse is 548 light-years. That's 25% closer than previously measured. The second new fact, Betelgeuse's diameter has been reduced by the same percentage. The star is now known to be 25% smaller than previously believed. The cause of Betelgeuse's dramatic dimming was also determined. The giant star ejected a cloud of gas that contained magnesium. The cloud blocked a large portion of the light coming from Betelgeuse and made it appear visually much dimmer than it really was. Magnesium is not halfway to iron on the periodic table which means Betelgeuse is not as far along on the path to a supernova as was suspected previously. When iron starts forming in the star, it means that this star is close to shutting down its fusion reactions. The next step is implosion. We aren't quite there yet with Betelgeuse. This star emits most of its energy as infrared light, and it also indicates that its core is most probably still burning helium, and not something that would greatly increase the amount of heat, like carbon for instance. Betelgeuse will still go supernova, but not for another 100,000 years. So you can cross it off your supernova list for the time being. And as for how to correctly pronounce Betelgeuse, you can say it any way you like. There are as many different pronunciations out there as there are people who think they know how to pronounce it correctly. Now, Supernova 1987A caught astronomers off guard when it lit up the large Magellanic Cloud 100,000 plus light years away from the Milky Way. That's when attention was turned to a similar star much closer to Earth, Rigel, in the constellation of Orion. Could Rigel surprise us and suddenly go supernova? There's something called the supernova problem that you should, you know, probably know about because it may relate to Rigel going supernova or not. It seems that stars over 17 solar masses don't always go supernova. Recently, a red giant star simply vanished. Once again, it didn't go supernova, it disappeared. This had often been happening in computer simulations of supernovae, and now it finally occurred in real life. 
Rigel's mass is 21 solar masses. In other words, it's 21 times more massive than our Sun. So, will Rigel go supernova or simply vanish into a black hole that it'll create in its core? Astronomers and physicists continue their work of learning more about the dynamics of massive stars, scouring the sky for the next supernova in the Milky Way. Meanwhile, we can rest confident that we on Earth are in no danger from the harmful effects of nearby supernova explosions. We live in a nice, quiet, peaceful, stellar neighborhood. Except for those Martians next door. A powerful burst of gamma radiation lasted a mere half-second, but it released an enormous amount of energy. It was more than our sun would produce in 10 billion years. This brief flash lit up the whole sky. Afterward, a much softer and more long-lasting glow replaced it. Astronomers examined the phenomenon with X-ray, radio, optical, and infrared waves. It turned out that people had finally seen a newborn magnetar for the first time ever. It was likely formed after two neutron stars had merged. It resulted in a kilonova, one of the brightest and largest stellar blasts. Its light finally reached our planet on May 22, 2020. Imagine a massive star, at least five times the mass of our sun, reaching the end of its life. It might be because it's run out of its nuclear fuel. If it happens, the star starts to cool off, the pressure inside drops, and the gravity starts to squeeze inward. And then, more than a million times the mass of our planet collapses within 15 seconds. It happens so fast that an enormous shock wave causes the outer part of the star to blow up. It produces a blinding burst of light. This powerful blast is called a supernova. What's left behind is an incredibly dense core with a huge cloud of hot gas, called a nebula, expanding around it. If the star has been massive enough, more than 10 times the size of the sun, it's likely to turn into a black hole. If not, it turns into a neutron star. It's basically a giant nucleus, the central part of an atom. These stars are mostly made up of neutrons and are rarely larger than 20 miles across. For comparison, our Sun is almost 865,000 miles across, which is 109 Earths put side by side. But don't let this relatively tiny size fool you. Any neutron star is at least one and a half times heavier than our Sun and has an intense magnetic field. If you scooped just a teaspoon of this star's insides, this matter would weigh more than a billion tons. It's so dense that it makes neutron stars some of the most extreme objects people know about. The next stop is the black hole itself. When two neutron stars merge, they most often create a new, much heavier one. Within milliseconds, or even less, this star collapses into a black hole. But the astronomers who examined the flash of light recorded in March think there might be another outcome. They're almost sure they saw something never observed before the birth of a magnetar. That's a rare form of a neutron star with an ultra-strong magnetic field. It's 1,000 trillion times stronger than our planets. This field is also so powerful, it heats the star's surface up to 18 million degrees Fahrenheit. To put it simply, magnetars are the most powerful magnets in the universe. Their magnetic fields can seriously mess with the neighborhood. Atoms, unlucky enough to get close to such a star, get stretched into pencil-thin lines. If you somehow found yourself several hundred miles away from a magnetar, it would end badly for you. The magnetic field would first disrupt your bioelectricity. It means that your nerve impulses wouldn't work anymore. Even your molecules would change under the influence of the star's field. In the end, you'd pretty much vanish. If a magnetar flew within 100,000 miles from our planet, it would wipe out all the data on every single credit card in the world. It was the year 2017 when astronomers spotted a bright star hurtling out of the Milky Way. It was moving incredibly fast at a speed of 2 million miles per hour. That's almost four times as fast as the Sun orbits around the center of our home Milky Way galaxy. It takes our star more than 225 million years to complete one journey. Anyway, back to our star, the Wanderer. The main issue with it was that it was moving against the direction in which most stars travel around the center of our galaxy. Even more bizarre, it consisted of totally different star stuff. Astronomers managed to identify its composition. 
The star was made up of heavy metallic atoms. At the same time, most of the other stars consist of way lighter elements. The wandering star got the name LP40-365. It was moving so fast that it literally dashed out of our galaxy. This made scientists believe that the space traveler was pushed out of its place by some kind of cosmic disaster, like a supernova. A supernova is the largest explosion that can take place in space, an explosion of a star. It happens after irreversible changes start in the core of a star. Supernovas can occur in two ways, in binary star systems and when there's a single star. Binary stars are two stars orbiting around the same center. At some moment, one of the stars, a very dense white dwarf, starts stealing matter from its companion. After some time, this thief accumulates too much matter, which causes it to explode into a supernova. Or it can be a single star nearing the end of its life. It's running out of its fuel. More and more mass is flowing into the core of the star. In the end, the core becomes so heavy that it fails to withstand its own gravity. After the core collapses, a tremendous amount of energy is released in a supernova. But astronomers still can't figure out how a supernova could send LP40-365 flying. There are more questions than answers. Was it a companion star that got flung out by a shockwave created by a supernova? Or was it a piece of the exploded star? A new study based on the collected data has shown that the star, which is a white dwarf, keeps slowly rotating around its axis. Astronomers are almost sure it means LP40-365 is indeed just a chunk of space debris and not a full-fledged star. This wandering piece somehow managed to survive one of the fiercest space events. But after making such a conclusion, scientists realize something amazing. LP40-365's unusual features could appear after the star witnessed a supernova. Even though this event happened lightning fast, the entire makeup of the star got changed. Most stars consist mainly of helium and hydrogen, but LP40-365 is different. It contains such heavy elements as magnesium, oxygen, and neon. It must have been the supernova that added these atoms to the star's composition. By the way, astronomers consider all elements that are heavier than helium to be metals. This means that after witnessing the supernova, LP40-365 became metallic. Right now, the star doesn't have its own planets, but NASA's Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, which is on the lookout for distant planets passing in front of their host stars and dimming them, has noticed a curious thing. LP40-365 brightens and then dims again every 8.9 hours. It might mean that the star pulsates, but usually stellar pulsations are much less regular. A more plausible explanation is that the star's surface is uneven. And as it spins, sunspots are brought into and out of view. And it's great news, because after astronomers figure out how fast the star rotates, they can understand what happened to it around 5 million years ago during the supernova. Bright blue exoplanet HD 189733b looks peaceful and eerily familiar. Doesn't it resemble Earth? But this appearance conceals the planet's terrifying nature. There, the winds blow at 5,400 miles per hour. It's seven times the speed of sound. But that's not the worst. It rains glass, sideways, in this scorching, hot world. Neutron stars are ultra-dense collapsed cores of giant stars. They emit X-rays or radio waves. But in 2018, astronomers discovered a weird stream of infrared light. It seemed to be coming from a neutron star 800 light-years away from our planet. The most plausible theory is that this signal was probably produced by a disk of dust surrounding the star. But there isn't enough evidence to confirm this idea. Mercury is the fastest planet in the solar system. It zips around the sun at a breakneck speed of more than 100,000 miles per hour. That's around 40,000 miles per hour faster than our home planet. It's one of the reasons why a year on Mercury equals 88 days on Earth. Mercury is the planet that orbits the closest to the Sun. That's why if you were standing on its surface at its closest approach to our star, the Sun would look more than three times as large as it does on Earth. 
The Black Widow Pulsar is a rotating neutron star that is munching on its partner, which is a lightweight brown dwarf star. The more material the pulsar consumes, the more slowly it spins. The energy the neutron star is losing in the process causes the companion star to dwindle. There's a stellar nursery in the constellation Centaurus, and even though this place is called a nursery, it's anything but peaceful or safe. It's made up of hydrogen and newborn stars and is located in a nebula around 6,500 light years away from Earth. A nebula is a giant cloud of gas and dust floating in space. The intense energy baby stars emit makes hydrogen clouds glow ominous red. This energy is so powerful, it's eating away dark clouds of dust. Astronomers can see them disappear like lumps of butter on a hot frying pan. Faraway Neptune-sized exoplanet Gliese 436b is a paradox. It's made of scorching hot ice, and this ice is burning. The planet completes one full orbit around the red dwarf Gliese 436 in just two days. It means the exoplanet travels very close to its parent star. That might be the reason why the planet's temperatures rarely drop below 800 degrees Fahrenheit. But the strangest thing? The planet hosts huge volumes of water ice known as Ice X. And this ice remains solid despite such incredibly high temperatures. Jupiter is the largest planet in the solar system. It's 318 times as massive as Earth. It's also two and a half times as massive as all other planets of the solar system combined. But here's a paradox. If this gas giant got even more massive, it'd actually become smaller. The added mass would make the planet denser, and this would cause it to start pulling in on itself. Astronomers claim that Jupiter can eventually end up being four times as massive as it is now. But at the same time, its size won't change. DGSAT1 Galaxy is as big as the Milky Way, but it's nearly invisible because its stars are spread out incredibly thin. But what makes the galaxy so unique is that it's sitting all alone, unlike other galaxies of this kind. Those are usually found in clusters. It can mean that DGSAT1 was formed in a different era, probably a mere 1 billion years after the Big Bang. If it's true, the galaxy is a real living fossil. Saturn's moon, Hyperion, is one of the most bizarre-looking moons in the solar system. But the appearance isn't the strangest thing about this space body. The pumice stone-like rock is pockmarked with countless craters, and it's also charged with static electricity, which is flowing out into space. About 4,000 light-years away from Earth, there's a planet that seems to be one enormous diamond. The planet is denser than any other discovered so far and consists mostly of carbon. It's so dense that astronomers think this carbon might be crystalline. It means that at least some part of the planet is diamond. Ceres is the most massive space body in the asteroid belt between Jupiter and Mars. It totals almost a third of the entire mass of the whole belt. But at the same time, Ceres is the tiniest of the dwarf planets out there. It's also the only dwarf planet that dwells in the asteroid belt, and also the only one that is located in the inner solar system. Astronomers sometimes call Jupiter a failed star. The gas giant indeed contains a lot of helium and hydrogen. But its mass isn't enough to start a fusion reaction in its core. And that's exactly how stars produce energy. They fuse the atoms of hydrogen together under extreme pressure and heat and create helium. In the process, they also release light and heat. Jupiter could start a nuclear reaction and become a star only if it was 70 times its current mass. Space is completely, eerily silent. That's because in the vacuum of space, there's no atmosphere, and the sound waves need some medium to travel through. That's why worlds with atmospheres like Earth are full of noise. Unlike their massive siblings, hypothetical mini black holes could be really tiny, not bigger than an atom. Even so, just one minuscule thing would have enough mass of a thousand sedans. One theory claims that tons of micro black holes could be created right after the Big Bang. Some scientists even go so far as to say that a couple of mini black holes pass through our planet every day. 
Every hour, the sun sends more energy to Earth than our planet uses in a year. Even though people are now using much more solar energy than a decade ago, it's still a mere 0.7% of the world's annual electricity usage. There might be moons orbiting other moons, but astronomers haven't agreed on this theory yet. Planets orbit stars, moons orbit planets. But why can't there be moon moons, also known as submoons, moonettes, and moons? Researchers claim that moon moons could exist, but the host moon has to be massive enough and the moon moon small enough. There must also be a large distance between these moons and the host planet. Jupiter is the most massive planet in the solar system. This means its gravity is also the most intense. It's 2.5 times as great as what we have on our home planet. Once, the gas giant's gravity even tore apart a large comet called Comet Shoemaker-Levy 9. Then the planet eagerly swallowed the chunks of the former comet. If you were standing at the equator on Mars, the temperature at your feet would feel like that of a warm spring day, but your head would be literally freezing. Lost in space and drifting through galaxies, rogue planets were once flung away from their parent stars, but one of them floating 200 light years away from Earth is different from the rest. It's a planet-sized object with a magnetic field 200 times stronger than that of Jupiter. This field is so powerful that it generates never-ending flashing auroras in the planet's atmosphere. Europa is one of Jupiter's largest moons, even though it's smaller than Earth's moon. But the cool thing about this satellite of the gas giant is that it's covered with ice. And some of this ice is smooth, which means you could skate there. And a three-foot axle jump you can perform on our planet would take you 22 feet into the air. At the same time, the landing speed on Europa would be the same as it is on Earth. Haumea, a dwarf planet orbiting the Kuiper Belt, has a bizarre elongated shape and two moons. The day on this planet lasts four hours, making it the fastest spinning large object in the solar system. But the most mysterious thing about Haumea is that the planet has a thin 40-mile-wide ring circling it. Astronomers haven't managed to figure out how or why it appeared around the dwarf planet. Eleven Earths could fit across the equator of Jupiter, and if our planet was the size of a grape, the gas giant would be as large as a basketball. Nine spacecraft have already visited Jupiter. Seven of them just flew by, and two orbited the huge planet. The most recent of them, Juno, arrived at Jupiter in 2016. The craters of the moon's south pole are likely to be the frostiest place in the whole solar system. The crater's floors are always in the shadow. That's why the temperature never rises above 397 degrees Fahrenheit, even during the day. If you decided to fly a plane to Pluto, your journey would take around 800 years. You'll find the highest mountain in the solar system on an asteroid called Vesta. Its peak rises 14 miles above the base of the mountain. This makes Rye Silvia, that's what the mountain is called, almost three times taller than Everest. Saturn's rings weren't discovered all at once. It happened gradually. That's why they were named alphabetically in the order scientists found them. Now they go like this. D, C, B, A, F, G, and E. A day on Venus is around 243 Earth days long. But the bad news is that you'd have to wait for a weekend for three years. All because a day on Venus is longer than its year. A solar phenomenon called Terminator Events is taking place at the Sun's equator. Disastrous magnetic field collisions seem to cause ginormous twin tsunamis of plasma. These tsunamis tear across the star's surface, moving at a speed of 1,000 feet per second. They can last for weeks at a time and happen almost every decade. The winds on Neptune are the fastest in our solar system. Most of them can reach the speed of 1,600 miles per hour. Almost any of these enormous storms could easily swallow our entire planet. The 18th brightest star in the night sky, Fomalhaut, is a terrifying sight. It's dubbed the Eye of Sauron because a ring of dust and debris circling it makes it look like a giant eye staring into your soul. 
The intimidating star is more than twice the mass of our Sun and is 25 light years away from Earth, which isn't that far away considering distances in space. Mars has two moons, Phobos and Deimos. In the next 30 to 50 million years, the planet's gravitational forces will tear Phobos apart. It'll probably result in the formation of a ring around Mars. An asteroid the size of a car enters the atmosphere of our planet every year. Such an intruder could wipe out a small town off the face of the Earth. Dust and smoke would rise into the atmosphere, preventing sunlight from reaching the surface of the planet. It would cause the temperatures all over the world to drop and the climate would change. Luckily, such asteroids burn in the atmosphere before they even come close to the surface. The radio signal produced by a spacecraft when it contacts Earth is less powerful than a light bulb in your fridge. By the time this signal reaches our planet, its power is only one billionth of one billionth of a watt. No wonder that antennas gathering these super weak signals are huge. The deep space network that detects signals from spacecraft has dish antennas that measure up to 230 feet across. That's more than the width of a soccer field. In 1999, NASA lost a Mars orbiter because one engineering team was using the metric system and another was doing calculations with the help of the imperial system. Nebulas are giant clouds of gas and dust. With time, gravity starts to pull these clumps of dust and gas together. They grow larger and larger and their gravity gets more powerful. One day, a nebula's mass becomes so great that it collapses under its own gravity and forms a new star. Around 4,000 light years away in the constellation of Scorpion, there is the Butterfly Nebula. Its wingspan is greater than three light years and the structure inside the nebula is one of the most complicated ever observed. The nebula's central star, a white dwarf, is heated to an insane 450,000 degrees Fahrenheit. This means it was formed from another huge star, likely more than five times the size of our Sun. The white dwarf is surrounded by a thick disk of dust and gas at the equator. That's what probably makes the whole structure look like an hourglass or a butterfly. If you decided to lump together all the known asteroids in the solar system, their total mass wouldn't exceed even 10% of the mass of our moon. A cloud of water vapor is floating in space. It surrounds a supermassive black hole 12 billion light years away from Earth. The cloud contains 140 trillion times the entire volume of water on our planet. Astronomers think this water cloud appeared just 1.6 billion years later than the universe itself. The densest objects in space are neutron stars. They're the size of a small city, yet their mass is about 1.4 times the mass of our sun. A single teaspoon of neutron star material would weigh a billion tons. And a neutron star's gravity is 2 billion times stronger than the gravity of our planet. In 1993, the Galileo probe was traveling past a miniature asteroid. It was no more than 20 miles across. And still, the tiny thing had a one-mile-wide moon. Astronomers have discovered tons of moons orbiting minor planets in the solar system since then. We live inside the Sun. The star's atmosphere stretches way beyond its visible surface, and our planet is well within its reach. That's how the gust of the solar wind creates such a breathtaking phenomenon as the northern and southern lights. Earth's magnetic field hides a fascinating story. It turns out that it's getting weaker day by day. In fact, it's been doing so for the last 3,000 years. And if this trend continues, we could be in for some trouble within a millennium. What's the big deal? Well, picture this. Magnetic north becomes south, and vice versa. Pretty wild, right? When this happens, our planet's protective magnetic shield might weaken, allowing more cosmic rays to hit us. These high-energy particles from the universe can cause electronic malfunctions in our satellites and produce elements that could be harmful to us. The last time a polarity reversal occurred was between 772,000 and 774,000 years ago. 
Thankfully, humanity has some pretty smart people on the case who are investigating the history of Earth's magnetic field. They take cores of sediments from the seafloor and study the magnetization of fossils to figure out when these reversals occurred in the past and when they might happen again. Another group of researchers is studying the South Atlantic Anomaly (SAA), a vast region of Earth's magnetic field that is about three times weaker than the field at the poles. Using data from multiple satellites, they are trying to figure out what's causing the SAA and how it might change in the future. This could give us a glimpse into how a weakened magnetic field can affect our satellites and our planet. Sure, our generation won't be here to witness these changes, but it does make you wonder what that planet might look like upside down. Magnetically, that is. NASA's astronomers have also announced that in 4 billion years, the Milky Way galaxy is going to get a major glow up. After a cosmic collision that will shake things up, I'm not talking about a small fender bender here, I'm talking about a titanic collision with our neighboring Andromeda galaxy. Humanity will have to hold on to its space helmet for this one because the sun might get flung into a new region of the galaxy. However, our Earth and solar system probably won't be seriously affected. Sounds difficult to believe, so how come? NASA's Hubble Space Telescope did some hardcore measurements of Andromeda's motion. Although the galaxies will plow into each other, the stars inside each galaxy are so far apart that they won't collide with other stars during the encounter. However, the stars will be thrown into different orbits around their new galactic centers. According to simulations, our solar system will probably be tossed much farther from the galactic core than it is today. Set your telescopes aside, you don't need to start counting down the years. This event is likely scheduled in about 4 billion years, so chances for us to witness it are zero. Saturn is losing its rings. Thankfully, we won't be here to witness this sad event either. Apparently, the rings are being pulled into Saturn as a dusty rain of ice particles, all under the influence of Saturn's magnetic field. According to NASA's research, the ring rain is draining an amount of water products that could fill an Olympic-sized swimming pool from Saturn's rings every half an hour. The entire ring system will likely be gone in 300 million years. Scientists believe we should consider ourselves lucky to witness Saturn's ring system at all, as it seems to be in the middle of its lifetime. But if you think about it that way, that rings around planets are all temporary, there's a chance we've just missed out on the giant ring system of Jupiter, or those of Uranus and Neptune. These planets have only thin ringlets around them these days. Scientists have long debated whether Saturn was formed together with its rings or if the planet acquired them later in life. The new research favors the second scenario, indicating that they are unlikely to be older than 100 million years, while Saturn itself is around 4.5 billion years old. What caused the rings to appear in the first place? Well, there are a few theories. One of them suggests the rings could have formed when small, icy moons in orbit around Saturn collided. Perhaps their own orbits were messed up by a gravitational tug from a passing asteroid or comet. Who knows what humans might end up looking like in the future? It's unlikely we'll see any major changes in our lifetime. But let's take a journey to the future and ponder what we might evolve into. Will we become cyborgs with all sorts of cool machine implants? Or maybe we'll become a hybrid species of biological and artificial beings. To understand our future evolution, we gotta take a peek at our past. A million years ago, Homo sapiens didn't even exist. There were a few other similar species though, like the Neanderthal. Fast forward to today, and humans have become taller and sturdier. Maybe in the future we'll become smaller to conserve energy as it's predicted that our planet will get more crowded. Speaking of crowded planets, living in these new conditions means we have to adapt and fast. We're constantly interacting with lots of people, 
and remembering names is becoming a crucial skill. Luckily, technology might help us out with brain implants that will improve our memory. In the future, we might also have more noticeable technologies as part of our appearance. Imagine having an artificial eye with a camera that can read different frequencies of light. While predicting a million years into the future is pure speculation, we can use bioinformatics to make some predictions about the immediate future. Demographic trends suggest that urban areas will become more genetically diverse, while rural areas will become less diverse. And what about space? If we end up colonizing Mars, our bodies could change due to lower gravity. Maybe we'll have longer arms and legs, or even insulating body hair like our Neanderthal cousins. In the future, our moon is also going to witness some dramatic changes. We'll miss these ones too. In about 5 billion years, things are going to get really interesting in this corner of the universe. For now, the sun is chilling in its main sequence phase, just burning hydrogen like nobody's business. In the future, during the red giant phase, the sun is going to puff up like a balloon until its atmosphere reaches out and engulfs our beloved Earth and Moon. Our natural satellite, which is already moving away from Earth, is going to get warped around the sun's influence. Its orbit will get all wonky, and it'll end up closer to Earth during the new moon phase than during the full moon. And that's not even the worst part. If left alone, the moon would keep on moving away from Earth until it'll need almost 50 days to orbit us. As the sun continues with its own journey, its atmosphere will drag on the moon and cause its orbit to decay. Eventually, the moon will get torn apart into a stunning ring of debris circling Earth. We're talking about all its mountains, craters, and even the footprints and flags we left there, all scattered throughout the debris field. There's a chance the sun will shed enough mass to spare Earth and the moon from total annihilation. Or if we're really lucky, the sun will lose 20% of its mass and we'll be safe and sound. It's all just theory right now, we haven't seen a red giant star during this phase. The universe itself might go completely dark one day too. Scientists can't predict it with absolute certainty, but they can make some educated guesses. Right now, our universe is 13.77 billion years old, and it's still churning out new stars left and right. It's said that eventually, after about 1 trillion years, the last star will be born. That final star will be a little guy, a red dwarf, just a fraction the size of our sun. These stars are champs at living long lives, slowly sipping on hydrogen to keep their fusion reactions going. But even they can't last forever. Fast forward about 100 trillion years and the last light will go out. The universe will be dark and lonely, but thankfully we won't be here to watch it all fade away. Castles were cold places in times past. The stone seemed to radiate the winter chill. This is one practical reason why tapestries were hung upon castle walls, to help keep the cold out and the warmth in. But you just can't hang any old thing on castle walls. It should be beautiful, heroic, with a heavy wow factor. The ancient Greeks hung tapestries on the walls of their castle of the sky. Glorious tapestries woven of stars. All 48 constellations of the Northern Hemisphere were designed and named by the Greeks. The story of Andromeda is one such tapestry. Woven of seven constellations spread across the entire autumn sky, the story contains detailed astronomical observations preserved as highlights in the sky tapestry. It begins with the constellation Cassiopeia, queen of the oldest realm in Africa, Ethiopia. When the constellation Cassiopeia is on the horizon, it looks like a staircase going up to the Milky Way. Step pyramids around the world are often thought to have been inspired by the constellation Cassiopeia. In any case, Cassiopeia is a beautiful constellation, indicating that Queen Cassiopeia was also a beautiful woman. She was good-looking, but equally vain, which sets off all the dramatic action. Cassiopeia can be found in the night sky opposite Ursa Major from the North Star. 
Like Ursa Major, Cassiopeia circles the North Star and is a circumpolar constellation. A supernova was observed in Cassiopeia around 1680 Earth time. Cassiopeia A having occurred about 11,000 years earlier. The Chandra X-ray satellite recently recorded an extraordinary photograph of this supernova remnant showing the elements sulfur, calcium, silicon, and iron amid the expanding cloud's high-intensity X-rays. Cassiopeia's husband is also a circumpolar constellation, a minor, dim one named Cepheus. He had his own kingdom. A merger of empires by way of marriage is something common throughout history. Cepheus was a king of Phoenicia. There were many kings of Phoenicia back in the days when Phoenicia was just a collection of city-states along the western shore of the Mediterranean Sea. Cepheus can be found in the area between Cassiopeia and the North Star. The constellation of Cepheus is important to astronomers. It's where Henrietta Swan Leavitt discovered variable stars that pulsed at regular intervals. The rate of pulsation of the star indicates the true brightness of the star and enables a sure measurement of the distance to the star. The discovery of Cepheid variable stars was a major breakthrough for early 20th century astronomy. Cepheus and Cassiopeia had a daughter, Andromeda, also a noted beauty, about whom all the fuss is. It seems that one day Cassiopeia was boasting about the beauty of her and her daughter Andromeda. We are more beautiful than any other women in the whole wide world. Well, such pretension can be forgiven for a queen. But then Cassiopeia went further and stepped beyond all natural bounds. In fact, we are more beautiful than any of the Nereids. Well, the Nereids were Greek mythological sea nymphs, daughters of the ocean. Noted for their beauty and kindness to sailors, the Nereids, all 50 of them, took offense at being diminished, dissed, by a mere mortal woman. Cassiopeia had to be punished for exceeding the bounds of the civil order. By her excessive vanity, Cassiopeia transgressed beyond the bounds of nature, for which an unnatural punishment was inflicted upon the entire kingdom of Ethiopia. A monster from the bottom of the ocean, the constellation Cetus, began to devastate the coastal villages of Ethiopia as well as Ethiopia's fishing ships. Fittingly, Cetus is a constellation of the southern celestial hemisphere. The fourth largest by area of all the constellations, Cetus swims in a dark part of the sky called the ocean, with only its head rising above the celestial equator. This part of the sky contains several water-themed constellations – Pisces, the fishes, Aquarius, the water-bearer, and Eridanus, the river. Over 50 exoplanets have been discovered in Cetus. You can bet the James Webb Space Telescope will have a field day analyzing the spectra of these planets' atmospheres, looking for signs of life. Meanwhile, Queen Cassiopeia and King Cepheus must do something about the monster devastating the shores of Ethiopia. They consult an oracle and make another trespass beyond the realm of reason and nature. Tell us, oracle, what can we do to stop the monster from ravaging our kingdom? This monster is not a normal affliction of nature. An offense was committed against the higher realms, and this is the punishment. The monster cannot be stopped by any normal means. Only a human sacrifice of the noblest being may placate the beast. One error compounds another. The noblest person in the kingdom, of course, is Princess Andromeda. According to the command of her father and the consent, or perhaps a suggestion of her mother, Andromeda is chained to a rock offshore. She is the human sacrifice that her parents hope will save the kingdom. Wow. Da -da -da -da. Here comes the Greek hero to save the day, stop the human sacrifice, and turn Cetus to stone. Perseus. Now, where is Perseus coming from? According to legend, the Hebrides. Perseus went to the Hebrides in pursuit of the Gorgon Medusa. The geological scope of this tapestry is incredible, from the Hebrides to the Red Sea. The Hebrides are an archipelago of mostly rocky islands off the western coast of Scotland. It was impossible to sail any further. The Hebrides were the absolute end of the world. Perseus didn't have to sail to the Hebrides. However, he flew on a pair of winged sandals. Hey, way to go, Perseus! Now, Medusa was one of the all-time baddies. One look at Medusa was so terrifying it would petrify you, literally turn you to stone. Perseus was in great danger. 
So, what did our hero do? Instead of looking at Medusa, Perseus used the scientific principle of reflection. He slew Medusa by seeing her reflected in his polished shield. In our sky tapestry, Perseus is portrayed holding up the severed head of Medusa. In the night sky, one eye in Medusa's head opens and closes and opens again. Arabic astronomers named the star Algol, the ghoul. Algol is an eclipsing double star. One star is bright, the other one, not that much. As the dimmer star orbits the bright star, it passes in front of the bright star, eclipsing it, and the eye closes. Since the dim star takes 2 days, 20 hours, and 49 minutes to orbit the bright star, the eye in Medusa's head opens every day and a half or so. The constellation of Perseus is immediately below Cassiopeia, and sky watchers quickly look to see if Algol is eclipsed, if Medusa's eye is open or closed. Perseus flew back from the Hebrides, accompanied by Pegasus, the winged horse. The central part of Pegasus is the Great Square, made up of four stars. As Earth goes around the Sun, the Great Square is right in the center of the night sky in autumn. In the summer, the summer triangle of Vega, Deneb, and Altair are in the middle of the night sky. In spring, it's Leo the lion, and in winter, it's Orion the hunter. These are the walls of the castle in the sky, and all have marvelous tapestries adorning them. The constellation of Andromeda shares a star named Alpharetz with Pegasus. It's one of the corners of the Great Square, so it appears Andromeda may be riding on Pegasus. Her crown, remember she is a princess, is floating nearby. M31, the Andromeda Galaxy. To see M31, cross the corners of the Great Square from the lowest star to the uppermost star, and then go a little further to see the Andromeda Galaxy. Be sure to peek at it from the corner of your eyes. It's called averted vision. The corners of your eyes are more sensitive to light, so you'll be able to see the huge spiral galaxy 2.5 million light-years away as a smudge of light one and a half times wider than the full moon. Now, Perseus doesn't go in for human sacrifice, so he stops it and saves Andromeda by exposing Cetus to Medusa's gaze. And here we encounter the second eclipsing variable in our sky tapestry, Mira, the heart star of Cetus, the sea monster. Mira, from which we get the English word mirror, so fitting in a story about vain beauty, is an eclipsing double star. The dim star orbiting the bright star is a white dwarf, not bright enough to see with the unaided eye. The effect is that Cetus' heart shuts off. Mira is eclipsed and disappears. This cycle repeats itself every 332 days. Our fabulous star tapestry has the only two eclipsing binary stars visible to unaided eyes the nearest spiral galaxy, and a hero that doesn't like human sacrifice and uses the scientific principle of reflection to thwart mythological monsters. Wow, I would hang that in my castle too. Just saying. When you look at the night sky, it seems like there's not much happening up there and that the stars always twinkle at the same spot. For thousands of years, researchers followed the idea that the lights in the sky were unchanging. Sailors guided their ships using fixed stellar patterns. There are also the exact outlines of constellations we observe today, and astronomers identified them a long time ago. It seems impossible that, one day, we wake up and simply can't see some stars anymore. Or does it? A team of researchers at Vanishing and Appearing Sources During a Century of Observations, or VASCO, studied the sky to check how things with the stars are going. The astronomers got the data from Gaia, the European Space Agency, and compared the information from 70 years ago to that from today to see how the sky has changed. To test it right, they had to use both modern and old telescopes. And something really interesting happened up there. Over 700 stars from the old maps were missing. If one star disappears, Multiple theories could work, but it's harder when hundreds of them vanished at the same time. Could it be that the data was wrong, or these stars were too faint to detect? Nope, they quickly eliminated this option because these stars had clearly been part of their earlier observations. So, the first thing that comes to mind when talking about how stars disappear is that they reached the point where they ended their lives. You can have the most massive stars of all, 
and we're talking about those that are way heavier than our sun. And they go through sudden changes as they get to the end, which we also call a supernova. It's a powerful explosion that later shines for many, many months. And it's still visible, even across hundreds of millions of light years. But that's the point. You see the traces, unlike here. Could this be a failed supernova? That means maybe one of them collapsed but turned into a black hole and consumed the remains from the inside out without causing a powerful explosion. But no one's been mentioning any signs of a black hole being active anywhere near those stars. And what if the stars had become less visible because of dust or gas around them? This is something that can easily happen as interstellar dust and gas do block our view of objects that are far away. But there were no traces of unusually high concentrations of dust or gas. Nothing destroyed them either. Researchers would have seen traces if something like that had happened. Plus, these missing stars were not all in the same area, which means there probably wasn't just one fatal thing that made them all disappear. Also, the stars were not at the same stage of their life. So it's not an option they were all accidentally close to their end. They weren't particularly old or young, and they were on different levels in size and brightness. At some moments, it even seemed these stars haven't vanished because of some natural events. Maybe it was something related to other civilizations that might be somewhere out there in space. Maybe that's one of the ways to look for them. We could stumble upon some secret civilizations from other planets if we carefully observed the behaviors of stars, especially those we can't explain. No one knows what exactly happened with the missing stars. And unfortunately, right now, all we have are these theories. But you have to admit, they're cool though. Maybe it's just some kind of optical afterglow caused by gamma ray bursts, or maybe even fast radio bursts. Fast radio bursts are powerful pulses of radio waves. They can release more energy in a couple of thousandths of a second than our giant sun does in almost a hundred years. We don't really understand how these energy eruptions work yet, so we don't know what they can do. But still, hundreds of stars at approximately the same time. There are between 100 to 400 billion stars in our galaxy, so we'll probably see some of them disappear too. Hopefully, we'll understand better why such things can happen. Of course, scientists are not sure about this number because we can't see all of the Milky Way stars from our home planet. Some are too faint, some are too far, or even hidden by dust or gas. But they assume these numbers based on the size, shape, and likely mass of the Milky Way. And out of billions of stars, there are a little over 9,000 of them we can see with the naked eye. If you want to see more, you need a good telescope that will reveal those fainter ones your eyes are unable to discern. Many of the stars we see in the night sky are probably not alive anymore. Stars are giant balls of gas that produce light and heat through nuclear fusion in their cores. However, stars also have a limited lifespan, and eventually, they run out of fuel and stop shining. When a star passes, it can either become a white dwarf, neutron star, or black hole, depending on its size. Scientists have discovered that some of the stars we see in the night sky are too old to still be shining. This means that they may have faded, but we are still seeing their light because it takes so long to reach us. Actually, we may be looking at the past when we look up at the stars. Check out all of the stars you can see with your bare eyes. They lie within about 4,000 light years of us. That means what we're seeing are stars that appeared 4,000 years ago. Most of the stars we know of exist within galaxies, which are massive collections of stars, gas, and dust held together by gravity. Still, there are large areas of empty space between galaxies too. And the question is, could they have any stars? It seems that these areas of space are not completely empty. There is still some gas and dust, as well as dark matter, which is a type of matter that we cannot see but we know exists because of its gravitational effects on other objects. Scientists have even discovered a few isolated stars in these areas of space. These stars didn't form there. They ended up there by accident, 
which means they have probably been ejected from their galaxies by gravitational forces or collisions with other objects. And there could be more of these stars than we realize, but they are simply too dim to be seen from Earth. Stars don't actually twinkle. It's more that we just see it like that from the Earth. It seems like they twinkle because of the turbulent atmosphere of our planet. The light from a star must pass through many layers of the atmosphere. Not every layer is equally dense, so this causes the light to slightly deflect and change in color and intensity. There's one star named Sirius that sometimes twinkles, sparkles, and flashes so much that some people even tend to report it as something extraterrestrial. This is because Sirius is very bright and is often low on the horizon, which means it experiences more of these special effects of the Earth's atmosphere. When in space, astronomers and astronauts who observe stars from there don't see them twinkling. Hey, want to hear something cool? Me, you, your friends, the rest of humanity, we're all made of stardust. The elements that make up human bodies and all life on Earth were formed inside stars. The building blocks of life, such as carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, were created inside stars and were eventually released into space when the stars were gone. These elements then became part of new stars, planets, and eventually, life on Earth. The iron in our blood was created in the cores of supernovas, which are massive explosions that occur when stars fade. Some say that even the calcium in our teeth and bones is likely to come from exploding stars. The oxygen in our lungs was created in the cores of massive stars before being released into space through supernovas. Do me a favor, will you? Try to imagine the first time you went camping. Maybe you went with your parents. Maybe it happened on a class field trip with your schoolmates. Regardless, try to picture, or remember, what it felt like as the day was coming to an end. The sun has set, but there's still some light outside. Let's say you were lying down, trying to rest for a bit. What's the first thing you remember seeing when looking up? If you're anything like me, it was probably the overwhelming number of stars twinkling right before you. These stars, most of which you can see without any fancy devices, are part of the Milky Way. Believe it or not, our amazing galaxy is almost as old as the universe itself. Age aside, it's also a pretty nice place to be. The Milky Way is like a cosmic nursery where new stars are born. And let me tell you, it's home to some of the most fascinating places, at least from what we can see in pictures. Take the Mystic Mountain, an area in the Carina Nebula. Here, things are always splashing and full of energy. That's because of gas columns collapsing and creating crazy opposing jets that are thrown around like acrobats in a circus. It's like a signature move for stars being born, you know? And if you take a look at this awesome picture, you'll see the elements putting on a colorful show. Blue represents oxygen, Green is for hydrogen and nitrogen, and red is the sizzling sulfur. Ready for our next stop on our ride through the Milky Way? Check out these huge, twisted clouds of interstellar dust and gas hanging out in the center of M16, also known as the Eagle Nebula. We've got ourselves the super cool Pillars of Creation, which are like towering columns where brand new stars like to hide and chill. Now, I know this ain't the first time the Hubble telescopes captured this epic sight, but trust me, this is the most mind-blowingly detailed image yet. The pillars are getting showered with crazy hot ultraviolet light from a bunch of young stars hanging just outside the frame. These stellar superstars are actually causing the towers of dust and gas to gradually get worn away by their gusty winds. Brace yourself for the numbers, too. These pillars of creation stretch out for about four to five light years. Yeah, it sounds big, but in the grand scheme of things, they're kind of like the cute little siblings of the larger Eagle Nebula, which spans a whopping 70 by 55 light years. The nebula was first spotted back in 1745 by an awesome Swiss astronomer, and it's about 7,000 light years away from our humble abode. 
in the constellation Serpents. Here's the quirky part, though. As productive as it might sound, the Milky Way's star-forming activity is quite rare when compared to other galaxies. Astronomers have noticed that the pace at which stars are being born is actually dropping, and they're itching to figure out why. But before we can dive into this weird phenomenon, let's look at how stars come into existence in the first place. It's hard for us to know for sure from down here. What we can gather about a star's life cycle comes from looking at those within our local Milky Way. Stars are formed in colder clouds of gas and dust called nebulae. These areas are pretty common throughout most galaxies. These nebulae have low temperatures that are crucial for hydrogen gas to stick together. As the clump gathers more gas, it causes movement, which itself creates energy. When more gas collides with the already formed clump, all that energy transforms into heat. This keeps going until the temperature grows considerably, sparking the birth of a star. The most secure time of a star's life is also known as its main sequence. I'll spare you the chemistry lesson, but during this time, the star produces both heat and radiation. It's because of the radiation that there's pressure around a star, and it's also the reason for most of the light found in a certain galaxy. Now let's talk star sizes. The bigger the star, the faster it consumes its fuel. These massive stars shine the brightest, emitting high energy UV light. On the other hand, lower mass brighties live longer, despite not being as shiny as their larger siblings. There's a variety of star sizes in most galaxies we're able to see from down here. Some stars are 0.1% the size of the sun, while others have 10 times its mass. Once a star finishes up its fuel, it welcomes its grand finale and transforms into a faded star. Stars about the same size as the sun or smaller can no longer produce radiation at this stage. Gravity takes over, causing their matter to settle into a white dwarf. For bigger stars, the timeline changes a bit. They too collapse, but there's a lot more stuff burning, and it's also hotter in there. This collapse creates a stronger core. When all of the star's insides are done for, the outer layers collapse in a jiffy. It bounces off the core at nearly the speed of light. It's an impressive, explosive event called a supernova. The blown out material becomes the basis for future stars. It also leaves behind a black hole. Now that we know a bit about a star's life, let's try to look at each generation, if you'd like. Stars don't just pop up constantly at the same rate. Currently, the universe is manufacturing only about one-ninth the number of stars compared to its star-forming glory days, which happened roughly 10 billion years ago. One study gave us a peek on the history of star forming. In writing it, two scientists teamed up to gather a ton of data about galaxies. They sorted these galaxies based on how far away they were. By doing this, they could track how the brightness of galaxies has changed over the universe's lifetime. Since stars give off most of a galaxy's light, they could use that brightness to figure out how many stars were forming using some fancy math. Their findings confirmed that star formation was pretty wimpy when the universe was young. But as gas started to gather in galaxies, boom! Star formation skyrocketed until about 10 to 11 billion years ago when it hit its peak. After that, star formation took a nosedive. In today's observable universe, it's dropped a lot. That means around 50% of the stars we see today were born in the first 5 billion years post Big Bang. A mere quarter formed in the last 6 billion years. So what's causing this cosmic shift? Well, scientists think it's all about that cold gas that stars need when they're born. When galaxies form, the gas gets concentrated inside, leading to a star formation extravaganza. But then, the gas is used up quickly as stars doze off. When supernovae come into play, they blast away that much-needed gas for future star-making. 
Not to mention it also changes the chemistry of that gas. This crucial piece of information could be a starting point for the star-making decline we see today. Scientists are still not sure why this gas becomes useless. Galaxies are also pretty complex to begin with. There are all sorts of forces involved in maintaining their balance. For instance, when a supernova goes boom, the shock waves can sometimes cause turbulence and clumping of the gas, sparking the birth of new stars. But if the supernova is too wild, it can blast that same gas right out of the galaxy. With no gas left in the area, there's little to no chance a new star could form. Now, what does the future hold? Some scientists can't help but wonder what might happen if no new stars pop up. The universe might be simply filled with black holes and fading stars. Solar systems would become inhospitable as their stars lose power, and those ravenous black holes might munch on whatever material is left. As gloomy as it seems, you do have to admit it's a mind-boggling concept. Luckily, we don't have to worry about it happening anytime soon. The universe is a whopping 13.7 billion years old, but the dark era isn't expected to kick in until somewhere way further in the future. But hey, this is just one possible outcome of the decline in star formation. Who knows what other wacky possibilities the universe holds? No one will hear your cry in space, or something like that. We've all heard this famous chilling phrase, and it's actually true. Space, for the most part, consists of a giant nothingness. There's a lot of, you know, space in space. But this doesn't mean there are no sounds in space. In fact, there are plenty of them. And some of them can even make you shiver. Let's take a look at the scariest space sounds. First of all, how are cosmic sounds even recorded? Sound is just the vibration of molecules. When you scream, you make the molecules push each other furiously until they reach the ear of the person you're yelling at. Then these vibrations get transmitted to the brain, and we recognize them as something that you might need to apologize for. In other words, to hear something, we need molecules. And that's where things get complicated. There aren't any of them in space. The entire universe almost completely consists of a vacuum. No, not a hoover. Absolute nothingness. However, the wizards from NASA still record space sound somehow. So how do they do it? The thing is, there are some types of waves that don't care about molecules. We regular folk can't perceive them without some special devices. These waves include, for example, radio waves. We'll need a radio or something like that to recognize them. And that's exactly what NASA's satellites do. They catch random radio waves. Thanks to their heroism, we can find out how different cosmic bodies sound. These satellites record a variety of waves, fluctuations of plasmas, magnetic fields, and other, you know, stuff. And then scientists from NASA transform all this into normal soundtracks. And some of them sound quite frightening, to put it mildly. Let's take our magnetic field, for example. It surrounds our planet like an invisible shield, protecting us from all sorts of nasties, like radiation and solar winds. At the same time, we can neither see it, feel it, nor hear. Oops. Well, the last one is outdated. Scientists from the Technical University of Denmark took magnetic waves recorded by the ESA swarm satellite. They converted them into an audio track and got a pretty creepy result. Now, to be honest, it sounds more like an eerie entity stalking you in the middle of the night. And if you remember the maps of Earth's magnetic field, it starts to feel like a spider crawling nearby. Ew. And this isn't the first strange sound that we caught on Earth. Recently, we caught another weird radio emission from space. Scientists found out that the repeating signal came from somewhere very far away, like billions of light years away from us. Such fast radio bursts usually lasted no longer than a few milliseconds, but this one was unique. It lasted about three seconds, basically thousands of times longer than usual. And at the same time, the signal was very precise, so much so that scientists even compared it to a heartbeat. Scientists believe that this signal is caused by pulsars, or neutron stars. One time, Nikola Tesla caught something similar. But unfortunately, at that time, 
we didn't know about such things as pulsars, so Tesla was sure that he had caught a message from some extraterrestrial life. It's a pity that the truth turned out to be much more boring. But let's move on from the Earth to the Moon. In 1969, the astronauts of the Apollo 10 mission, the spacecraft that made the final test flight to the Moon, flew past its surface. And then they caught some strange signals coming from the dark side of the Moon. The side that we never see because the Moon is tidally locked to us. The sound was so weird that the astronauts weren't even sure whether to report it to NASA. They were afraid they wouldn't be taken seriously, and maybe even not allowed to participate in the next space missions. Here's what it sounded like. But according to NASA, it's not some creepy extraterrestrial music at all. These may just be some radio waves that affected each other because of their proximity. Although the astronauts who heard it for the first time probably felt a little creeped out. Let's move to the other planets. Now, 40 years ago, scientists actively explored the surface of Venus. They sent as many as 10 probes there, which were supposed to capture audio and video shooting from the surface. Now we know what Venus, which could easily destroy us at any attempt to even get close to it, sounds like. Horrifying. And you wouldn't expect anything else from the most dangerous planet in the solar system. Unfortunately, Venus is even more toxic than the average Twitter user. <laughs> so these probes didn't last too long. They heroically arrived on a planet and soon broke down. Next one is Jupiter. This space giant, which is 11 times larger than the Earth, never fails to scare us. One of NASA's probes, Juno, flies around Jupiter every few weeks. The probe is moving at a tremendous speed, 130,000 miles per hour. One day, Juno caught one of the strongest invisible signals it had ever encountered. This was the point at which the mad solar wind came into conflict with the magnetic field of Jupiter. It kind of sounded like a cosmic boom. The original sound lasted two hours, but it was compressed to a few seconds. It actually sounds more like a collision of a sea wave and a rock. But here, in terms of horror, Jupiter surprisingly loses to one of its small moons, Ganymede. In 2021, the Galileo space probe flew past Ganymede, and during its flight, it received a rather strange recording. These sounds are satellite radiation, and it's unclear whether it sounds like a cozy sunny day in the jungle or like thousands of bats waiting for you in the night. Next one is Saturn. This signal was caught by the Cassini-Huygens Automatic Interplanetary Station, which was launched into space in 1997. When flying past Saturn, Cassini recorded a pretty scary sound. This terrifying cry of thousands of souls is actually just some radio waves. They aren't too different from what the auroras emit on Earth. A little later, Cassini received another recording. The sounds made by lightning and thunderstorms on Saturn. They sound pretty interesting, too. More like popping corn or a Geiger counter, right? But that's just because these lightning strikes have a crazy frequency. Moving on from the solar system to outer space. The famous Voyager 1 was launched back in 1977 and continues to send us data even 40 years after its launch. In 2012, it left the solar system and entered interstellar space. And then, while abandoning its home, Voyager 1 detected the sound of plasma waves. The original recording lasted seven months. But fortunately, scientists felt sorry for us and reduced it to 12 seconds. It isn't really eerie, but is still kind of unsettling. And although it feels like nothing can beat Saturn's horrors, let's end this tournament with one of the scariest objects in the universe, a black hole. This sound was recorded by the Chandra Space Telescope. While studying a cluster of galaxies in the constellation Perseus, they discovered something strange. Some undulating movements appear from the center of the cluster. They spread out in all directions, like circles on the water. Scientists have suggested that this was caused by a supermassive black hole. The thing is, black holes don't always devour space objects entirely. Sometimes they kind of spit them out. This causes vibrations of gases, which we can convert into soundtracks. What's interesting is that the oscillation of each such wave 
actually lasts about 10 million years. You're just listening to a very accelerated recording. Scientists have reduced the delay between oscillations by about 144 quadrillion times. So, let's check it out. This is probably the eeriest sound from the whole list. Nothing too loud or wild, but there's something dark and disturbing about it. Now, those were the scariest space sounds captured by NASA. To be fair, most of them sounded creepy simply because they're radio waves. But it's still fun to get spooked sometimes. Imagine a basketball spinning on someone's finger. A point near the middle of the ball takes longer to spin back to where it started than the spot where your finger is. Earth spins in much the same way. People in the center of Africa are turning at 1,000 miles per hour as the planet rotates, while anyone at the South Pole doesn't really move at all, other than rotating in place. At the same time, we're all moving forward through space equally fast, since the planet is also hurtling around the sun at 67,000 miles per hour. The temperature at the boundary of our planet's inner and outer core is 10,800 degrees Fahrenheit. That's as hot as the surface of the sun. And the pressure there is 3.3 million times the atmospheric pressure at sea level. Two or three years ago, an asteroid was pulled into Earth's orbit and started to travel around the planet. Even though it's no larger than an average car, it's still a big deal. Out of more than one million asteroids astronomers know about, it's only the second one to orbit our planet. Called 2020 CD3, it's our temporary mini-moon. It won't be with Earth for long, though. The asteroid is following a random orbit and is slowly drifting away. Temporarily captured objects, such as 2020 CD3, are rare. They need to have a specific direction and speed to be caught by Earth's gravitational pull. Otherwise, they either crash into the planet or fly in another direction. The movement of galaxies and clusters billions of light years away from us suggests there's some enormously massive body outside the visible universe. After billions of years, the expansion of the universe will make the space so sparse that we won't be able to see the stars in the sky at all. The moon isn't a perfect sphere. It's shaped like an egg. Plus, the satellite's center of mass is a bit more than a mile off its geometric center. Even though Venus is the hottest planet in our solar system, it still has snow. But not what you'd expect. It snows metals and rains acid. <laughs> not a great vacation spot. Saturn is mostly composed of hydrogen and helium, with some traces of methane, ammonia, and water. But it contains more sulfur than Jupiter, which gives the planet a smog-like orange hue. On Earth, sound waves make air molecules vibrate, which is why we're able to hear sound. Other planets and moons allow sound to travel through mediums like their atmospheres and oceans, too. In space, though, it's said that there is no sound, since there aren't any molecules to vibrate and deliver sound waves. However, not all researchers agree on this, given that space isn't just a desolate vacuum. In between the emptiness, there are clouds of gas and other stray particles. So, depending on where you are, sound waves can be possible. Astronomers know for sure that the universe is growing bigger, and the speed at which it's ballooning is increasing all the time. But if the whole thing is swelling into something bigger, then it must have some kind of an edge, right? It's unlikely that people will ever find out, but if so, then what would it be? A ginormous brick wall and then nothing? An abyss that leads to nowhere? The most common theory is that the universe is shaped in such a way that it can't have an edge. But it's not the only idea. Another theory is even more difficult to comprehend. The universe is, indeed, infinite. And our part of it isn't that unique. It means that somewhere out there, there's another you. Or rather, other you. One of them is just a bit shorter. Another wears their hair in a different way. And the third one is identical to you in all possible ways. There's also a theory about a multi-universe that consists of many smaller universes. And the universe we live in is just a tiny bubble among other similar bubbles. Those scientists who support this idea are also sure that bubble universes can come into contact with one another. Then gravity starts to flow between them. And when two or three universes connect, a big bang occurs, just like the one that created our home universe. 
Neptune is the windiest place in the solar system. Clouds of frozen methane are whipped across the planet at a speed of 1,200 miles per hour. Neptune's core is solid and consists mostly of iron and some other metals. Its mass is 1.2 times bigger than that of Earth. The temperature inside reaches 9,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Astronomers also believe that at a depth of 4,500 miles, there might be a diamond layer where it's raining diamond crystals. On Earth, people are used to a beautiful sunset that's painted in hues of orange, red, and yellow. On Mars, however, the normally pinkish red sky turns blue as the sun goes down under the horizon. It's because Mars is much farther away from the sun than Earth, making the sunlight less intense. The fine dust in the Martian atmosphere absorbs the blue light and gets rid of the warmer colors that you typically see on Earth. Whether it's blue or yellow, both sunsets look spectacular. At around a quarter of the size of Earth, the Moon is pretty enormous relative to other satellites out in space. There's nothing quite like this situation anywhere else in the solar system. Pluto has a moon that's almost half as big as itself, but it's more like a twin than a satellite. There are more than 150 moons in our solar system, and Earth's is the fifth largest out of the whole lot. There might be a labyrinth of lava tubes on the moon. Not long ago, astronomers received the results of an underground lunar topography. They discovered a massive cave under the satellite's surface. About 30 miles long and 60 miles wide, the cave's likely to be the result of three billion-year-old volcanic activity. After streams of lava hardened, they created a thick, hard crust on the outside. But inside, lava kept flowing, melting the rock, and forming tunnels and caves. Countless pits in the moon's surface discovered by NASA might be the openings to lava tubes. We can't dig up most of Earth's gold. 99% of it ended up in the center of the planet several billion years ago, attracted by the iron in Earth's core. We're talking about 1.6 quadrillion tons of gold here. That's enough to coat the entire planet's surface in 1.5 feet of the stuff. And if all those meteorites hadn't later smashed into the ground, bringing extra amounts of gold, it would be even rarer. Not so long ago, astronomers discovered a massive blob of some mysterious substance. It was hidden underneath the surface of the moon's far side. Its mass was the same as that of a pile of metal five times larger than the big island of Hawaii. The enigmatic something lies almost 200 miles beneath an enormous crater that appeared on the lunar surface billions of years ago. The blob likely has something to do with a super collision. It might be the metal core of the object that hit the moon back then. Scientists can't wait to lay their hands on the discovery. It could explain lots of things about the South Pole Aitken crater, the largest known in the solar system. If it was on Earth, its oval-shaped basin would stretch from Washington, D.C. to Texas. In 2011, astronomers discovered an enormous water reservoir simply floating in space around a supermassive black hole called a quasar. Floating water vapors have been found throughout the universe, but they aren't that common. This particular reservoir holds around 140 trillion times the amount of water in the Earth's oceans. It's one of the oldest, largest, and, at more than 12 billion light-years away, one of the farthest things known to humankind. Astronauts in space can lose about 1% of their muscle mass each month. To prevent this, they have to stick to an exercise regimen that lasts two hours every single day. The Milky Way galaxy and the Andromeda galaxy are going to meet in 3.75 billion years. They're moving toward each other at a breakneck speed, when the two galaxies collide, they'll form a huge elliptical galaxy. I won't be around then. Have you ever looked up at the night sky and tried to count all the stars? Yeah, good luck. Our galaxy, the Milky Way, has about 100 billion stars. But other estimates put it at over 200 billion, since calculating the exact amount is an almost impossible task, even for astronomers. As for the entire universe, there are at least a billion trillion stars. That's one with 21 zeros after it. For comparison, that means there are more stars in space than there are grains of sand on all of the Earth's beaches. Our Sun. Scenario 1. Something strange just happened now. 
every TV channel, the news, they're all talking about a black hole that came closer to us, on the spot where our sun used to be. You can even see an accretion disk, and the background of the sky looks kind of distorted, which means it got really close. Normally, black holes are so far away that we can't see them with the unaided eye. You can't even see them with a telescope directly. What's it doing here so close? And where's the sun? Did the black hole swallow it? The sun used to be in the center of our solar system, far enough not to burn us, but still close enough to give us light, warmth, and beautiful scenes when it rises in the east and goes to rest in the west. Hey, this one even rhymes. <laughs> well, it gave us life. The most massive body in our solar system contains 99.8% of its total mass. It's so wide, you could fit more than a million Earths inside of the sun. Maybe our sun turned into a black hole, but it's way too early for that to happen. I mean, that's how they form, when enormous stars come to the end of their life cycle and explode, which is called a supernova. They end up collapsing on themselves, becoming very small. It's a tiny size and a huge mass. That's what makes black hole's gravity so strong, and even light that comes too close can't escape. And all the stars in the universe are shrinking, and will disappear at some moment. Our sun loses 4 million tons of mass every second, and eventually, the only energy left in the universe will be generated by black holes. A black hole is surrounded by dust, gas, and radiation. The radiation is very dangerous, so we hope our planet won't come near it. Our solar system doesn't have light anymore. No light and no heat either. So even Mercury and Venus will probably get covered in ice pretty soon, not to mention Earth. Do I need to say nothing will survive this new ice age? The only salvation might come from the accretion disk that spins so fast it generates heat, but that's too many chances to take. Still, at least if the black hole has the same exact mass as the sun before it, all the planets will remain in the same orbits, Earth included. But if it has a mass bigger than our sun, which is something our scientists are currently trying to figure out, then bye-bye, solar system. It was nice knowing you. Scenario 2 Oh no, what's happening? It was supposed to be a nice sunny day, but now you see darkness descending so abruptly. How come it's night, yet the clock says it's 2 p.m., and the moon looks different? The TV reports say our sun is gone. And due to some mysterious events, the moon is not orbiting the Earth anymore. It's in the center of our solar system now. We don't have much time left. Since the sun is not in the center of our solar system, we now have 8 minutes and 20 seconds to become aware of it. It may take millions of years for the sun's energy to travel from its core to the surface, but 8 minutes and 20 seconds is exactly how long it takes for sunlight to reach Earth. The light takes a journey across 93 million miles which is the distance that separates us from the sun. We're not in the habitable zone anymore. The habitable zone is the distance from a star, in our case, the sun, at which liquid water could exist on the surface of a planet. Now that the sun's gone, its light won't reach us anymore, and our planet will gradually become a frozen, lifeless rock. Who knows if we'll have enough time to come up with some technologies that would provide us with the solar energy we need to sustain life on Earth. If not, well, millions or billions of years later, scientists from some other civilizations would explore it, trying to find evidence if life ever even existed there. It would be the same as we do with Mars and other planets in our solar system, trying to figure out if they've always been lifeless or if there might be a sign that some organisms used to live there. Something else, also vital for our life, travels at the speed of light. Gravity. Without the sun, for roughly eight more minutes, the planets would continue circling the empty center of our solar system until the clock ticks and they finally drift somewhere into an unknown direction of outer space. Our moon doesn't have a strong enough gravity to keep us in place. It can't shine so brightly to give us warmth and support life. It's so far, we can barely see it now. Without the moon that peacefully travels close to our planet as it used to, we can see tides are getting lower incredibly fast. Oh, and it's becoming really windy. Winds are so much stronger and faster now. When things were normal, our planet sat at a 23.5 degree tilt, which is the reason we had changing weather and seasons. Now the tilt is so extreme, it's getting very cold, very fast. And our time is almost up. 
People are screaming. Everyone's in panic. We still have maybe one minute left until we sink into eternal darkness. Scenario number three. We're not sure what exactly happened and how the life we carelessly lived yesterday came to an end. No one could predict it, but it seems that, out of nowhere, a giant neutron star took the spot where our sun used to be. It's not something we'd recognize on our own. We just noticed something was different, and the sun kind of got smaller and weirder. The rest we heard on the news, and no one knows how it happened. Maybe our sun is somewhere behind the neutron star. Or the star pushed it out of our solar system and into an unknown direction? A neutron star is the densest space object we know about. It has almost twice as much mass as our sun, but it's all squeezed into a star only 10 miles, 15 kilometers, across, which is about the size of a city on Earth. A neutron star forms when a huge star runs out of fuel. It collapses in a big explosion. Its very central region, the core, collapses, which is why every electron, negatively charged particle, and proton, positively charged particle, crush together into a neutron, which is either uncharged or neutrally charged. We're in a very tricky situation now, basically waiting for our end to come. This neutron star has gravity two billion times stronger than the one Earth has. This means our new sun will pull all the planets in our solar system towards itself and eventually destroy them. It's already started. For the first time that we know of, the planets are leaving their stable orbits, attracted by the powerful force of the neutron star. It's becoming chaotic pretty fast. And it won't stop there. A neutron star rotates more than 700 times every second, which is incredibly fast. Our sun rotates once every 27 days. So after it destroys all the planets, including us, this star will continue whirling throughout the universe at about one-fifth the speed of light. Maybe it will slow down and fizzle out with time, but maybe not. After thousands of years, many neutron stars begin to slow down and blow out. But that doesn't always happen. If it meets another star, it will orbit it and start to feed off its atmosphere until it collapses at some point and turns into a giant black hole. Eh, our sun was going to burn out anyway. Until the neutron star showed up, the sun was 4.6 billion years old, which was about halfway through its lifespan. It had already burned off about half of its hydrogen stores and had enough supplies for another 5 billion years. It was eventually supposed to end up the size of the Earth. After running out of fuel, it would have simply collapsed. It would have retained its enormous mass, but its volume was going to be similar to that of our planet. No sun, no life. So the result would have been basically the same. But this way, it would have been a slow process. Who knows if humans would even inhabit this solar system in those times. But with neutron stars, things move towards the end pretty quickly. And it's way more chaotic. If the neutron star was going crazy somewhere far away in another galaxy, we'd only see it in the shape of a distant flashing light that we call a pulsar. But this way, boom! All aboard! This is the Intergalactic Cruiser. The destination on your ticket is a tour of the local group of galaxies. Featuring the large and small Magellanic galaxies, the Orion Nebula, the Andromeda and Triangulum galaxies, and a few surprises in between. Tickets, please. Be advised you may experience a slight tingling sensation as we rev into hyperspace. The ship and everything in it is going through a dimensional phase change. It's nothing to worry about. The tingling passes quickly. Now, passengers, as we head toward galactic latitude 180 degrees north, as Terrarians are accustomed to calling it, our first main item of interest will be an intense star-forming region known as M42, the Orion Nebula. But first, a special treat by the captain that's not on the advertised itinerary. The Horsehead Nebula. It's off to the port side. That's left for you Aggies. Its designation is M43. The newborn star at the top of the horse's head has a strong solar wind that is deforming the shape of the nebular cloud. Get a good look at it now, because in a few thousand years, those gases will be completely blown away by the star-like nebula that made our sun. Yep, long gone, except for the nebular gases captured by Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. 
Okay now, one of our junior explorers asks a question. What is the M in M42 and M43? Well, young lady, the M stands for Messier. Pronounce Messier, not Messier, as in, is your room messier than mine? <laughs> Charles Messier, I mean Messier to be precise, was a French astronomer in the 18th century. He published a catalog of 110 fuzzy objects as seen through an early telescope. The Horsehead Nebula is number 43 on his list. We'll see more M's as we continue our tour. Heads up, we're coming to the Orion Nebula. The gases in the nebula may seem less colorful than you expect. That's because we're accustomed to seeing long exposure telescopic photos and enhanced photos designed to highlight the different gases in the nebula. May I suggest using the pair of tinted glasses that come with your onboarding packet if you want to heighten your experience. In we go! Now, it's a good thing we are in hyperspace. As we approach the trapezium star cluster in the center, the bright star, Theta C, sends out a solar wind at 5 million miles an hour. It sculpts the whole cloud of gas and dust, creating shock waves that compress nearby stars. Theta C is a megastar, 200,000 times brighter than the sun. It will go supernova in about a million years. I won't be around then. Oxygen, hydrogen, and sulfur glow in ionized states like a fluorescent light bulb. Oxygen blue, hydrogen red, some green and sulfur, and dust glow as yellow-orange. As we pull out of the Orion Nebula and rise high above the galactic plane, the spiral arms of the Milky Way are visible. Our Sun, which you cannot distinguish from this height above the galaxy, is in the Orion Spur that lies between the outer Perseus arm and the inner Sagittarius arm. Notice the center of the Milky Way contains a bright magnetic bar that plays an essential part in star formation. Over 70% of nearby galaxies include magnetic bars. It's a sign of a mature galaxy. Only 20% of distant galaxies contain magnetic bars in their cores. Which reminds me, passengers, the juice bar is now open. Our H1 server will take your orders. Now, that's the Andromeda galaxy far, far out to the port side. But may I call your attention to the many dwarf galaxies, over 40 of them, that populate our galactic neighborhood. We're heading to one now. The Large Magellanic Cloud, LMC to astronomers, is an irregular dwarf satellite galaxy of the Milky Way, containing about 30 billion stars with a dynamic star-forming region called the Tarantula Nebula, which we will be cruising through shortly. Of course, if there is a large Magellanic Cloud, there must be a small Magellanic Cloud, SMC. And there it is, below and to the left of the LMC. The Milky Way will eventually ingest both dwarf galaxies. Some prefer the word accreted, but the result is the same. If you use your tinted glasses again, you can see that the LMC has stripped away a tremendous amount of gas from the SMC, as they have interacted gravitationally over millions of years. Hey, I know all about gas! Now we're heading out of the Milky Way to a distance of about 50 kiloparsecs. That's 50,000 parsecs, or about 163,000 light years. So, what's a parsec? No, it's not slang for pair of socks. A parsec is about 3.26 light years. A light year is about 5.88 trillion miles. The word parsec is a combination of two words, parallax and second. Parallax is the shift an object seems to make when viewed from two different perspectives. Looking at an object with your left eye and then your right eye, you'll see the object appear to shift. That's parallax. When an astronomical object is photographed with the Earth on one side of the Sun, and then again six months later on the other side of the Sun, the shift is measurable in degrees of arc, or minutes of arc, or seconds of arc, down to milliseconds of arc. That's a parsec, a parallax of one arc second, which turns out to be 3.26 light years. Hey, what about a Joan of arc? That's how you measure distances in France. <laughs> Meanwhile, since you can't measure a light year with a ruler or a tape measure, parsecs are the scientific way of telling the distance to a star or intergalactic object. 
The greater the parallax, the closer the object is. The smaller the parallax, the farther away it is. Now, straight ahead in the heart of the Tarantula Nebula is the R136 star cluster. Within a distance of one light year, there are over 40 stars each with a mass over 50 times that of the Sun. Wow! Comparatively, there isn't a single other star within four light years of our home star, Sol, and that's a good thing. You can see Supernova 1987A at about 2 o'clock high. A blue giant star, 100,000 times brighter than the Sun, experienced a core implosion, resulting in a Type II supernova 100 million times brighter than the Sun. It has left behind a neutron star, clouded in dust and gas, and a wildly spectacular display of fireworks. Now, 1987A in the Large Magellanic Cloud is the closest supernova to Earth since 1604, which happened in the Milky Way about 20,000 light years from Earth. It was visible in the daytime for about two weeks, or so. After 1987A went supernova because it was a blue giant star, Speculation has increased that the blue giant star Rigel, the foot star of the constellation Orion, might go supernova in the not-too-distant future, or already has gone supernova. Rigel is approximately 860 light-years from Earth, so anything that happens to Rigel would take about 860 years before it would be noticed on Earth. Supernova 1987A ejected the heavy elements, like cobalt, nickel, and iron, and lighter silicates into the Tarantula Nebula, where they will form the basic building blocks of stars and planets. Our server is now offering space-themed snacks. May I recommend the Jupiter Cotton Candy Puffs for the children on board? Aww. Remember, I know all about gas. Our next stop is the Andromeda Galaxy and Environs. Notice its halo as we leave the Milky Way and its 300 billion stars behind. As many as 150 globular clusters reside in the galactic halo. They orbit down and through the galactic disk and contain some of the oldest stars in the universe. How they got here in our home galaxy is a matter of intense study. You will notice NGC 6822, an irregular dwarf galaxy off to the starboard. NGC stands for New General Catalog of Astronomical Objects. Now you'd think there'd have been an old general catalog, but there wasn't. It was just a new catalog. There is, however, a revised new general catalog which astronomers refer to regularly. Clears that up, huh? As we pass NGC 6822, you'll notice a magnetic bar beginning to form and bright patches of new star formation. This galaxy was discovered in 1884 by E.E. E. Barnard, and is also called Barnard's Galaxy. Mr. Barnard was quite an astronomical observer. He has a crater on the moon named for him, one on Mars, an area on Jupiter's moon Ganymede, a minor planet, number 819 Bernardania, and the star with the fastest movement across the sky, Bernard Star. Now, not too many people have their name emblazoned across space, as has Edward Emerson Bernard. Approaching the giant Andromeda galaxy with its trillion stars, we will skirt above its western edge and visit one of the enormous galaxy's dwarf companion galaxies, M110 or NGC 205. Yes, it also has two designations. Hey, take your pick. The first of its kind, a dwarf spheroidal galaxy of about 3.5 billion solar masses, M110 or NGC 205 if you wish, has eight globular clusters near its core. It too will be swallowed, or accreted if you prefer, by the Andromeda galaxy. It may have already been stripped of much of its stars and gas, a point highlighted by M110's general lack of star formation. Everybody having fun yet? And now, our final stop, M33, the Triangulum Galaxy, the third and last spiral galaxy of our local group. Located in the small constellation of Triangulum, Latin for triangle, good guess, M33 is about half the size of the Milky Way. 
The Triangulum Galaxy is 2.7 million light years from Earth, but it is much closer to the Andromeda Galaxy and moving towards it. If two spiral galaxies collide, it may alter the course of the Andromeda Galaxy and prevent the predicted collision with the Milky Way. Well, let's hope so. Now, this important message. We will serve dinner on our return trip to Earth. There's a choice of chicken or fish. We hope you have enjoyed the tour. Hey, if you fill out our survey and give us five stars, you can also have dessert. Behold the distant future. Yep, humans have successfully colonized Mars and the Moon. Problems with overpopulation and hunger on Earth are solved. But soon, a new threat looms over our planet. Uh, excuse me, planets. And the Moon. Anyway, scientists have figured out that in 150 years, the Sun will explode and destroy our entire solar system. Bummer. There's enough time to build a fleet of huge spaceships and evacuate everyone. But it's not enough time to come up with some sort of sci-fi space jump. It's been a long time since people found a new, potentially livable planet, and the nearest one's a several million years ride away. There's no other choice. Humankind is evacuated into gargantuan spaceships, and the infinitely long voyage begins. A few decades pass. We leave the solar system and watch our sun explode. A huge flash and that's it. There's no more light. Just small, faraway stars and the infinite black depths of space. All ships are on a synced autopilot that won't go off course no matter what. Even if everyone on board were to disappear, the ship would still arrive at its destination. So, the upside, humans will survive for millions more years. The downside? Because of all of that time spent on space transports, we'll look different, totally different. Ships arriving to the new planet will be populated with shapeless, pulsating biomasses sitting inside metal exoskeletons. Here's how it happens. Bones in space get weaker, so do muscles. There's no gravity, so your body's not under any sort of pressure to keep it running properly. Astronauts on the International Space Station do a lot of exercise to stop their muscles from withering away. Ah, back to the story. There are gyms and special machines that recreate gravity on every space transport. But to save energy, they're only plugged in in a couple of hours per day. Unfortunately, no matter how hard people exercise, in space it just won't be enough. After the first hundred years, human bones have become so brittle that anything remotely physical can lead to injury. After another hundred years, people lose the ability to stand up on their two legs. But it's not only because of weak bones. After all those years in zero gravity, the human body's already changed a lot. A big problem is that people lose their sense of balance. If you try to stand up, you'll just fall. The ship's captains dismantled the gravity machines. They weren't working anyways. And all the sports equipment on board got taken apart ages ago and used as spare parts for the ships. The lack of gravity didn't just make people weaker. It also made them taller. The spine needs gravity to keep it stable. And now all those backbone discs have stretched themselves out. Humans are starting to look like blow-up toys. Everyone's given mechanical arms and legs. You just strap them on and get to work. Servicing the engine, cleaning out the bedrooms, throwing trash out into space, lifting anything. Not happening without those mechanical arms and legs. Time passes and people become more helpless. Luckily, the mechanical bodysuits keep getting better and better. Since the sun collapsed in on itself, human eyes have been having a hard time. Inside the ships, the sun is replaced by special artificial light that also gives off vitamin D. Since there's way less light overall, people's pupils become wider. Then, after a few more centuries, their vision really starts going downhill. But this problem is solved by technology. Artificial lenses magnify light and keep humans from going completely blind. The ships get disinfected every single day. That stops bacteria and microbes from multiplying. But it also means that the human immune system doesn't have to fight off any diseases. Pretty soon, humans can't defend themselves against anything. Even a mild cold could be seriously harmful. It's fine for now. 
there are no germs or anything on board, but what's going to happen later on down the road? On the ship, millions of plants grow in special greenhouses with water and ultraviolet light. The plants produce oxygen and spread it through the entire ship. Of course, it's not enough oxygen to satisfy millions, but it helps people remember the planet they left behind. After centuries of living on spaceships, humans have adapted to the new conditions and almost stopped breathing. Lungs have disappeared almost completely, and humans are starting to develop other ways of getting oxygen – from water, from liquid oxygen tanks – we're becoming a totally new species. But it's not all bad. Genetic engineering is developing every year. Full-fledged life support suits are created. They help with movement, strength, speed, vision, hearing, even speech. People's voices get so weak they can only speak in whispers. Luckily, the suits have built-in microphones and speakers. There's no food anymore, just specially created liquids. After all that time in space, the human stomach can't digest anything anyway. Fancy a handful of peanuts or a small cracker? Forget it! In the beginning, the special space food had loads of flavor. But over time, people sort of forgot what things were supposed to taste like. Eventually, they stopped adding in flavorings, and because of this new tasteless food, tongue receptors stopped working. Soon, people lost all sense of taste. For some people, this life seems unbearable, but they have a choice. They can just slide on into a cryogenic capsule for millions of years. Then it's just a matter of a quick defrost when the ships finally arrive. But it's seriously risky to be frozen for such a long time. There's no guarantee that the ships won't crash into a huge meteorite, or worse. People start to take a different approach. They upload their consciousness to a central computer. It's safer and requires much less power. And when you wake up, you can just download your mind into a new, modified human suit. Some people decide to stay awake and live a, quote, normal life. Thousands of years pass, then millions. Humans look really different now. All their limbs are now artificial, and the exoskeletons they wear are controlled by mind power. With each passing millennium, arms, neck, legs, and spines, they become smaller and smaller. Brittle bones soon dissolve into nothingness. Eyes, nose, and mouths disappear. The brain isn't protected by a skull anymore, it's just surrounded by soft skin. Only consciousness remains. Nowadays, a human is a powerful high-tech robot ruled over by a small, pulsating bag filled with a brain. It's been a few million years since humans left Earth. All the ship's inhabitants have already forgotten that their species was born on a planet with gravity. The history of life on Earth has become a myth, an ancient legend. Most people believe that these ships are their true homes, always have been. That's why, when humans finally reach their destination, no one's that eager to get off and have a walk around. Life on a new, unknown planet seems like a huge pain in the spacesuit. Gravity, air, bacteria, germs… It takes several thousand years of evolution for humanity to get used to these new conditions. Luckily, humans have a secret weapon – technology. At this point, all humans are downloaded from the central computer into new robot suits. People face a choice – get off the ship and make this planet their new home, or stay and live on the ships. Those that stay on the ships set off into the expanses of space to explore the galaxy and discover new worlds. Those who decide to stay on the new planet have to adapt to the new conditions. It's pretty different from Earth. There's a different air density, different weather patterns, and strange new chemical elements. It will take another million years before these robo-brain sacs take on a new shape. One day, these distant human descendants will want to research their origins. They'll invent a ship that can jump through space and time. The research will lead them to the distant past, to the small planet Earth, to now. This might sound crazy, but just imagine that tomorrow someone lands in your backyard and they're your descendants from the future. Those passengers who stayed on the ships will probably find new planets and maybe decide to stay on some of them. Their bodies will change and adapt too. 
So, in billions of years, the universe will be inhabited by different amazing creatures that all have something in common. They were all humans once. Wow! The James Webb Telescope has been fully deployed! If you're interested in astronomy or space, you've got to be excited about the James Webb Space Telescope. Here's why. For starters, it's huge. How huge? The primary mirror of the JWST is over 21 feet wide. The Hubble Space Telescope, the previous largest eye in space, has a mirror of about 7 feet 10 and a half inches. By comparison, if you place the two telescopes side by side, it'd be like putting a horse next to an elephant. And elephants are enormous. There's a perfect reason why the web, as it's affectionately called, is massive. It has to be huge, because it's not an optical telescope in the traditional sense that most telescopes are. The JWST is an infrared telescope. It sees heat. Infrared light has a longer wavelength than visible light, so it needs a larger mirror to focus that light. So what do we have here with the James Webb Space Telescope? We have two never-before things going on. We have incredible technology and incredible science missions. Both the missions and the technology are out of this world cutting edge. The web is a classic example of engineering in the service of science. Because of its greater light gathering power, the James Webb Space Telescope will be able to take images of things that we were never able to see before, but have always wanted to see. Things like exoplanets and the first galaxies in the universe and stars and planets forming inside nebulae. And you can bet that there'll be plenty of surprises too. The James Webb Space Telescope has several technological tricks up its sleeve which promise to provide its greatest scientific discoveries. The web has a coronagraph, and a very special coronagraph at that. The coronagraph is the tool that will allow the first real pictures of exoplanets. The coronagraph blocks out the bright pinpoint light of stars, which we already know have planets orbiting around them. Without the coronagraph, the starlight would make things too bright to see these planets, because planets are hundreds of thousands of times dimmer than the star. But with the coronagraph blocking the starlight, the exoplanets come into view. And the JWST coronagraph can block the light from up to 100 stars at once. We can expect a swarm of exoplanets. This brings us to the next high-tech gadget the JWST has up its sleeve, a no-slit spectrograph. Usually, an ordinary spectrograph will have a slit to allow a sliver of light to enter and be diffracted. Diffraction is the scattering of light to reveal the spectrum of the light's component wavelengths. But the James Webb Space Telescope's work is so sensitive that a sliver of light would overwhelm the optics. So a no-slit spectrograph was installed. The starlight gathered from the big mirror is sent into a fiber optic cable to send only a single spot of light into the spectroscope. And that's where the grism takes over. Sir Isaac Newton used a prism to discover the spectrum of sunlight, Roy G. Biv, as you may recall. But the web uses a grism. That's a compound word, like smog, which is smoke and fog. A grism is a graded prism. That means it has itsy bitsy, teeny tiny grooves that diffract the spot of light the big mirror sends down the fiber optic cable and into the spectrograph. The science of reading a spectrum of light is called spectroscopy. By analyzing the spectra of light from the exoplanets, the JWST will determine what gases are in the planet's atmospheres, as well as their density and even their temperature. It's an incredible advance in our knowledge. We'll be able to tell if a planet has oxygen or nitrogen, or methane, and other gases that may or may not indicate that the planet is habitable. Another Earth, perhaps. Presently, the JWST is parked in its permanent location. Unlike the Hubble Space Telescope, which orbits the Earth, the James Webb Space Telescope orbits the Sun. It orbits the Sun at one of the gravitational balance points between the Earth-Sun system. It just stays there, without having to use much or any fuel to hold its position. So, as the Earth orbits the Sun, the James Webb remains parked at a spot that is also orbiting the Sun. There are five gravitational balance points between the Earth and Sun. They are called Lagrange points, after their discoverer, Joseph Louis Lagrange, in the 18th century. The web is parked at L2, the second of the five Lagrange points, which lies 932,000 miles out into space, way beyond the moon. All this to observe a spot of infrared light. 
But first, the engineers must get, or acquire, that spot of light. To get a spot of infrared light, the 18 hexagonal mirrors had to be unfolded from their position inside the Ariane rocket that sent the web into space. Once the mirrors have unfolded, their positions must be adjusted to microscopic level accuracy so that all 18 mirrors produce a single image. Several tiny motors are attached to each mirror segment to make these adjustments. These motors, which must be activated individually, will gradually pull the honeycomb-like mirror segments into alignment. It's a critical part of the mission and takes months to complete. To align the mirrors to produce a single spot of light, the James Webb Space Telescope can't be jiggling around. The telescope must be kept absolutely motionless, and that requires two other cutting-edge technologies, the sun shield and the cryocooler. In space, direct sunlight is very hot, and shadow is very cold. Therefore, the James Webb Space Telescope brought along its own high-tech sun shield. It's huge, too, as big as a tennis court huge. Comprised of five individual layers of Kapton film, only a millimeter thick, each layer of the sun shield has to be remotely deployed individually using a system of eight motors and 139 actuators with thousands of parts. The purpose of the sun shield is to help the JWST stay cold. The colder, the better. And colder is what the cryocooler is for. Temperature can be measured three different ways, in degrees Fahrenheit, where water freezes at 32 degrees and boils at 212, in degrees Celsius, where water freezes at zero degrees and boils at 100 degrees. But neither of these thermometers have a starting point. So Lord Kelvin, in the 19th century, devised a third temperature scale, the Kelvin scale, which starts at absolute zero, the coldest temperature possible. The onboard cryocooler will cool the JWST to just seven degrees Kelvin, seven degrees above absolute zero. At this temperature, virtually all heat from motors is removed, and the telescope will be able to focus the light to a point without any noise, basically any motion interfering with the quality of the image. Finally, after all this incredible technology functions remotely as planned, we are almost ready to observe the infrared images from the giant multi-segmented mirror of the James Webb Space Telescope. Almost ready. A telescope can collect all the light at once, but in the end, it must also be able to detect what it's collected. If the light is not detected, it's not truly observed. Enter the piece de resistance, the infrared detectors. The web has 15 of them. The specially fabricated semiconductor material produces a slight electrical charge when struck by a photon of infrared light. The web's infrared detectors can produce a million pixel high def image. A few of the detectors can produce a four million pixel image. They must be durable enough to last 10 to 20 years without warping or corrupting, all while working at seven degrees above absolute zero. In themselves, the infrared detectors on the JWST are an engineering marvel. But what are they going to take pictures of? Ah, the missions of the JWST. Well, they're cutting edge too. 70 of the first 280 target observations are exoplanets. Is there another Earth? Which exoplanets seem habitable? The Webb Telescope will provide detailed spectroscopic analysis of the atmospheres of thousands of known exoplanets. For the first time, we will see images of exoplanets as they appear in infrared light. Cosmology, the study of the universe, is perhaps the primary mission for the web. Galaxies receding away so fast that their light is stretched into the infrared will be a prime target for observation. Hundreds of hours of observations are necessary to collect the faint infrared light from these first galaxies formed after the Big Bang. The JWST will give us a picture of what the infant universe looked like. Astronomers will learn new information about the dark energy that is driving the expansion of the universe and what role, if any, black holes play in the formation of galaxies. Star formation in the Milky Way and nearby galaxies is also part of the mission of the James Webb. By imaging hundreds of solar systems forming around newborn stars, astronomers will establish a definite history of solar system development. Now fact will replace theory and a big step forward will be taken in our understanding of space. The James Webb Space Telescope is a bold endeavor that will mark an epoch time in scientific history. In 2007, astronomers spotted a massive 54-ton asteroid roaming space relatively close to our planet. 
but later they lost track of it. That's why the space rock was declared a lost asteroid. Almost two decades have passed since then. And in November 2023, a report claimed that the lost asteroid, aka 2007 FT3, might hit Earth in 2024. Such news sounds ominous. But how true is it? Well, NASA disagrees. The U.S. Space Agency has refuted the worrying claims. This statement was issued in response to the announcement that there was a 1 in 11.5 million chance of the asteroid striking our planet on the 5th of October, 2024. The space agency states that at any time in the next century, there are no known asteroids that could pose an impact threat to Earth. NASA and other space agencies are watching the skies nonstop, determined to find, track, and categorize asteroids and NEOs near Earth objects. Hundreds of millions of rocks orbit the sun within the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. But only some of them come relatively close to Earth. NASA classifies asteroids orbiting within 30 million miles of our planet as near-Earth objects. Inside this group, there are particularly worrisome objects. Those are so large and orbit so closely to our home planet that they might turn into a real threat to the world should a direct collision occur. Luckily, the larger an asteroid is, the easier it is for our planetary defense experts to find it. The orbits of the largest space rocks around the Sun are normally well-known and determined for years and even decades. At the moment, NASA is keeping a close eye on an asteroid named Bennu. It's a fairly large space object reaching 1,610 feet across. It might smash into our planet in 159 years. According to experts, the asteroid, which was first spotted in 1999, is quite likely to drift into the orbit of our planet. If it happens, it might collide with Earth by the 24th of September 2182. Asteroid Bennu is thought to be taller than the Empire State Building. If it hits our planet, the collision will release 1,200 megatons of energy. That's an enormous amount of energy that nothing built on Earth could produce. But even though Bennu's chances of colliding with Earth are quite low at the moment, the space rock has still been categorized as a potentially hazardous asteroid. All because it might come as close as 4.65 million miles from Earth. That's the reason why it's also classified as a near-Earth object. Asteroid 99942, 942 Apophis, also known under the dramatic name of the God of Chaos, is another space body we'd better watch out for. It's a near-Earth object about 1,100 feet across. It was discovered in 2004, and at first it was identified as one of the most dangerous asteroids ever detected. Apophis gained notoriety very fast. It was believed to pose a serious threat to Earth. Experts predicted that it would come uncomfortably close to our planet in 2029. Luckily, after a more careful examination of Apophis and its orbit, astronomers concluded that there was no risk of the asteroid colliding with our planet for at least a century. The risk of an impact in 2029 was ruled out completely, as well as the potential impact that could be caused by the asteroid's close approach in 2036. Interestingly, until March 2021, there was still a small chance of a collision in 2068. But then, Apophis made a flyby of Earth, and astronomers took this chance to use powerful radars to estimate the asteroid's orbit around the Sun more precisely. This allowed them to rule out any impact risk for at least the next 100 years. A new study has just made the sweetest discovery ever. Newly born exoplanets might actually look like Smarties, that popular British candy rather than spheres. We've always kind of assumed that baby planets are born ball-shaped, but they might be oblate spheroids instead. A team of scientists from the University of Central Lancashire in England used computer simulations to build a model of the formation of planets in dense gas disks surrounding young stars. After that, they compared these models with actual observations and noticed that the young planets took shapes that defied any expectations. The thing is that even though more than 5,000 exoplanets have been discovered so far, astronomers still don't have a clear understanding of the sequence of events marking their birth and early evolution. But this new research might finally shed light on this process. After examining the formation mechanisms of gas giant planets like Jupiter, 
the team came to the conclusion that planets built up from their centers. After that, the researchers focused on the initial shapes of such planets. They were also interested in how they could encourage the growth of planetary seeds, resulting in the appearance of massive planets, sometimes larger than our solar system's largest giants. The standard theory of the formation of planets suggests that such growth occurs gradually and smoothly. First, dust particles start sticking together, forming progressively larger and larger objects. This process lasts for a very long time and is known as core accretion. It's the model of planet formation scientists favor. There's another theory, according to which planets' birth might happen over shorter periods of time. This idea involves a protoplanetary disk, a disk of gas, which makes up 99% of its mass, and dust, around 1%. This disk orbits a newly formed star, and planets are hypothesized to form from this cloud. Protoplanetary disks are believed to be common by products of star formation and range in mass from 0.001 to 0.3 solar masses. Inside such disks, matter slowly moves inward, and dust particles grow bigger to the size of pebbles. At one point, after two to three million years, a giant rotating protoplanetary disk breaks into pieces, and that's how baby planets are born. This theory is known as the disk instability method. The model built by the team seems to support this second, less favored theory rapid planet formation through disk instability, all because this theory explains how large planets can form relatively quickly at pretty large distances from their host stars. As for the weird flattened shape of these newly formed planets, it might be due to the material falling onto them. Most likely, it goes mainly to the poles of new planets. One of the main conclusions drawn by the research is that the appearance of young exoplanets as we see them from Earth may vary depending on how they are angled. If Earth is directed face-on to an exoplanet, it will seem that the latter has a traditional spherical shape. But if seen on edge, a baby exoplanet will look like a real smarty. The team is going to continue to investigate the formation of planets with the help of an improved computer model. They believe they will find out the role the environment around a young planet plays in affecting its shape and formation. Observations of young planets, which are often still surrounded by gas and dust, have become possible only recently. All thanks to such telescopes as the Atacama Large Millimeter Array, the ALMA telescope, and the Very Large Telescope. These observatories might provide additional data to support the Smarties theory. By the way, the construction of the ALMA telescope involved thousands of scientists and engineers from all over the world and lasted more than 10 years. The observatory is among the highest instruments in the world at an altitude of 16,570 feet above sea level. This puts it above much of Earth's atmosphere, which tends to blur and distort light, disrupting observations. Plus, ALMA is located in Chile's Atacama Desert, one of the driest places on our planet. That's why, almost every night, the sky is clear of clouds and free of light-distorting moisture. There are a few theories about how the moon appeared in the sky, and recently a new idea has popped up. But before we discuss this newcomer, let's look at the most popular hypotheses of the moon's formation. The capture theory claims that Earth's natural satellite used to be a wandering body, something like a large asteroid. It had formed somewhere else in the solar system before it was captured by our planet's gravity when passing nearby. The accretion hypothesis suggests that the moon formed in orbit around Earth at the same time as our planet appeared in the darkness of the cosmos. Then, there's the fission theory that says that at one point in its development, Earth was spinning so fast that some of its material broke away and started to orbit the planet. And the giant impact theory, which is the most popular these days, claims that the moon formed during a collision between Earth and another hypothetical planet called Theia, which was way smaller, probably the size of Mars. The resulting debris collected in an orbit around Earth and formed the moon. And now, let's move to the new theory you've been patiently waiting for. According to it, our satellite might have formed immediately, in a matter of hours, after the collision between Earth and Theia. 
the material from the two planets was likely launched directly into Earth's orbit right after the impact. It formed the moon and left traces deep inside Earth. In previous scenarios, Theia's remains were thought to have been scattered all over space, mixing with just a bit of the material coming from our own planet. But then, why do we see such shocking similarities between the moon's and Earth's compositions? Could it be that Theia was isotonically and chemically similar to Earth? Unlikely. But according to the new theory, more material from Earth was used to create the moon, its outer layers in particular. It might explain this similarity in composition. One more theory also tries to explain this mysterious similarity, the Synestia model. According to it, our satellite formed inside a swirl of vaporized rock left by the collision. But this theory can't explain the moon's current orbit. The new single-stage theory does offer us plausible explanations for both the similarities in composition and the orbit of the moon. It might also provide us with some answers to previously unsolved mysteries. Since this scenario puts the moon into a wider orbit and gives it an interior that is not fully molten, it can explain the satellite's tilted orbit and thin crust. In any case, to confirm one of these theories, we need to analyze future lunar samples that will be brought to Earth by NASA's upcoming Artemis missions. Scientists will be able to get their hands on some material from deeper beneath the moon's surface and compare if real data matches these simulated scenarios. In the past, the Apollo missions already brought back about a third of a ton of rock and soil from our satellite. These samples showed that Earth and the Moon had some remarkable chemical similarities. They could only suggest one thing. These space objects had a linked history. If the Moon had formed elsewhere and been captured by our planet's gravity later on, its composition would be very different from that of Earth. But if the Moon had been created at the same time as Earth, or if it had broken off our planet, the type and proportion of minerals on the moon would be the same as on Earth. But they are a bit different. The moon's minerals contain less water than their terrestrial counterparts. The satellite is also richer in materials that form rapidly at high temperatures. That's why the most accepted model of the moon's formation these days is the giant impact model. Meteorites coming from the moon are a great source of data for studying the origins of our satellite, too. They can tell us even more about the moon than Apollo samples, all because such meteorites come from all over the surface of the moon. Meanwhile, Apollo samples were collected just in one place near the equator on the near side of the moon. What makes space so terrifying is its unpredictability. Even though 99.99% .99 of the cosmos is a vacuum, if you encounter something of substance, the chances are high that it might easily end your life. And still, some things are scarier than others. For example, gamma ray bursts. When a galaxy explodes, it releases a powerful burst of gamma rays, and those can completely annihilate any asteroid or planet in their path. A gamma ray burst occurs in our home Milky Way galaxy once every five million years or so. Then there are vampire stars. Scientifically, they're known as O-type stars. Those are enormous blue giants attached to way smaller stars, which gradually get consumed by the gravitational pull of their huge neighbors. But vampire stars don't live long, happy lives. Once a space vampire has consumed a smaller star, it explodes into a supernova torn by its own gravity. Black holes are both endlessly intriguing and terrifying. They consume everything that comes too close and bend space-time around them. Can they get any scarier? Definitely, once we look at rogue black holes. One of them was discovered in 2016. This rogue black hole is heavier than the sun and is moving at a speed of more than 1,240 miles per second. This black hole could have broken away after the collisions of its home galaxy with another one. At the moment, it's around two billion light years away from us. Now, how about a mysterious space anomaly called the Great Attractor? This area lies around 150 to 250 million light years away from our galaxy. The Great Attractor's gravitational pull is so powerful that it can move entire galaxies toward itself making them collapse with one another. But the 
scariest thing? We still don't know what it is, and whether our galaxy will end up in its clutches one day. Meteors might not sound particularly exciting or scary, but they are some of the most realistic threats to our planet. Thousands of meteorites hit Earth every year. Luckily, most of them are too small to cause any serious harm. They either burn in the planet's atmosphere or crash into the ocean. Our own sun can be pretty scary too, especially when it produces powerful bursts of energy. Solar flares. They often go hand in hand with coronal mass ejections. Those are giant bubbles of ionized gas that can accelerate to incredible speeds. The most powerful volcanic eruptions pale in comparison to solar flares that release 10 million times more energy. Within a few minutes, one solar flare can give out billions of tons of charged particles. Solar flares are also insanely hot, with the temperatures reaching several million degrees F astronomers believe that such bursts of solar radiation happen when the sun's magnetic field gets twisted in some regions. At one moment, all the pent-up energy is released. The star sends out light and particles, mostly electrons and protons. Most solar flares last for minutes, but some continue for hours. A powerful solar storm can potentially cause a devastating global blackout on Earth. The next scary space phenomenon is the dark flow. All galaxies are supposed to be moving uniformly away from one another. But there's one large group of clusters that seems to be moving at a speed of 600 miles per second toward a small region of space between the constellations Centaurus and Vela. There seems to be no apparent cause for this, which is why this inexplicable phenomenon got its name. The cosmos also presents many dangers for astronauts. For example, extended space travel can apparently change human DNA. According to scientists, the stress from staying in space for too long might cause astronaut cells to rewrite their genetic code. The worst thing is that such DNA changes are permanent. Can a planet be bigger than its parent star? Well, if you mean a star like our sun, it's highly unlikely. But what if it was a white dwarf, the remnant of a star similar to ours that went out after shedding its outer layers and leaving behind nothing but the core? This core is what we call a white dwarf. Usually, it's around the size of our home planet. If a star had a planet bigger than Earth before it extinguished, it's possible that such a planet could survive all the chaos. In this case, a planet that is bigger than its star might actually exist. And we've even found planetary systems like this. But there's one problem. A white dwarf isn't a real star like our sun anymore. It doesn't produce energy, just sits out there getting cooler and cooler. So probably such systems don't count. For comparison, the sun is working non-stop. It is fusing hydrogen into helium in its core. It has been doing it for more than four billion years and is going to keep doing it for the next seven or eight billion years. The sun is 10 times as wide as the largest planet in our solar system, gas giant Jupiter. And sadly, you can't get a planet much larger than that. If you start adding mass to such a world, it will get smaller, not bigger. So it seems you can find a planet larger than the sun. But there are also dim red dwarf stars. They're the smallest out there, barely massive enough to maintain fusion in their cores. The tiniest stars that we know about have been discovered recently. If astronomers' conclusions are correct, then both of them can hardly fuse hydrogen into helium. And it takes about 0.077 times the sun's mass, or 75 masses of Jupiter, to be able to do that. And still, they're real stars, just very tiny, smaller than Jupiter. One of them is only about the size of Saturn, which must mean that stars can have planets bigger than they are, right? Well, theoretically, when it comes to practice, you can hardly find such planetary systems. We found and observed quite a lot of exoplanets, which are worlds orbiting other stars. It seems that there are indeed loads of trends out there in space, different masses, sizes, brightness, and so on. But the main trend? Red dwarfs don't usually have gas giants orbiting them. If they do have planets, those are typically small, rocky worlds, more like Earth. Those are also called terrestrial planets. For example, 
A red dwarf called TRAPPIST-1 has seven Earth-sized planets orbiting it. But gas giants circling around red dwarfs are extremely rare. Hardly one in a hundred tiny stars can boast such a planet. This number can be even smaller since the research has been done using candidate planets which haven't been confirmed yet. Plus, the smallest stars are also the dimmest. It means they are extremely hard to detect. And it's incredibly hard to figure out whether they have planets orbiting them. And if they do, whether these planets are gas giants or terrestrial worlds. Still, it's possible that a system where the planet is larger than its parent star exists. But the probability is statistically very low. At the same time, red dwarf stars are very numerous. They're actually the most common kind of star in the galaxy, making up around 70% of all stars. And even though really tiny red dwarfs are relatively rare, there still must be millions or probably even billions of them in the galaxy. And if there's even a small fraction of red dwarfs with gas giants orbiting them, it might still mean that a lot of such systems exist in total, and some of them can have planets bigger than their host star. Black holes are ruthless. They can swallow asteroids, comets, planets, and even stars. But can a black hole consume the entire universe? Almost any black hole was once a massive star that collapsed in on itself and became incredibly dense. Black holes have immense gravitational pull. Even light can't escape their clutches. The idea that a black hole can swallow the universe is based on a common misconception. People often think that black holes work like vacuums, pulling space inside. But that's not the case. Black holes can only swallow stuff that is extremely close, usually space objects venturing into their event horizon. That's a black hole's point of no return. Once you cross this border, there's no escape. The event horizon for a black hole with the mass of our sun could extend a mere two miles. If a tiny black hole had a mass of our planet, its event horizon wouldn't stretch for more than a couple of inches. It would be the size of your thumb, mm. no more. But a black hole's gravity still affects the stars and planets surrounding it. It might make them orbit, just like the black hole at the center of the Milky Way galaxy does. But the hole doesn't swallow them. If our sun somehow transformed into a black hole with the same mass, which is highly unlikely, Earth wouldn't feel any difference in the gravitational force influencing it. Our planet wouldn't change its orbit or hurtle toward the newly born black hole. Of course, it would get very dark and freezing cold, but being pulled inside a black hole wouldn't be a concern. Plus, most black holes are quite small. A black hole can only swallow a star if the said star is aimed almost directly at the black hole. Theoretically, it might happen. But according to space experts, for the sun to get swallowed up by a black hole at the center of our home Milky Way galaxy, a truly enormous amount of time would be needed. After all, the star's orbit would need to line up with the black hole in a very precise way. Even the largest black hole in the universe that we know about, a space titan called Ton 618, seems to be near the theoretical limit of how large black holes can grow. This limit is determined by the fact that black holes release tons of radiation while developing. This radiation heats up and ionizes the matter surrounding the black hole, which makes it more difficult for the dust and gas to cool down and fall into the black hole. As a result, it slows down the rate at which the black hole can feed. We can probably say that this self-regulation stops black holes from gobbling down entire galaxies, let alone the whole universe. And we shouldn't forget about the expansion of the universe either. Objects in space move farther apart, which makes it less likely for them to collide or get captured by a black hole. If a black hole were to consume the entire universe, it would require a tremendous shift in the direction in which space seems to be moving. So, hmm. you don't need to worry that one day, our whole world will disappear inside a huge, universe-swallowing black hole. Unless, of course, the universe is already inside a black hole. I'm not kidding. There's a theory that we might be living in a black hole. Think about this. What if a black hole already engulfed us long ago? Surprisingly, some physicists deem this theory pretty plausible. For example, Dr. Nikodem Poplowski, a theoretical physicist from Indiana University, 
states that everything that a black hole swallows may turn into a new universe inside the hole or on the other side of it. So who knows, perhaps our universe used to be quite a different place until it got pulled into a black hole. Mercury. Mercury formed when gravity pulled together swirling gas and dust to form a small planet closest to the sun. The planet changed its appearance as asteroids and comets crashed into its surface, just like our moon. Venus. The planet could have had a perfectly habitable environment for two to three billion years after the planet formed, suggesting that life had plenty of time to originate there. However, the resurfacing event triggered a series of incidents that caused a release, or outgassing, of carbon dioxide stored in the rocks of the planet. As a result, Venus's atmosphere became too dense and hot for life to survive. Earth. The planet was initially very hot, and the heavy iron sank to the center, while the lighter silicates rose to the surface. The entire process of planet formation took about 10, 20 million years to complete. Mars. Mars probably had a dense atmosphere that kept the planet warm enough for water to flow over the surface. Liquid water could probably have existed on both Venus and Mars at the same time. Jupiter. Looked about the same, only farther from the sun. It was one of the first planets in the solar system. Jupiter took on most of the mass left after the sun was formed. Jupiter's composition is similar to that of the sun. Saturn most likely did not originally have rings. Like Jupiter, Saturn is composed mostly of hydrogen and helium, the same two basic components that make up the Sun, the only planet in our solar system with an average density less than water. Uranus. Uranus probably formed closer to the Sun and moved to the outer part of the solar system about four billion years ago. Most, 80% or more, of the planet's mass is made up of a hot, dense liquid of icy materials, water, methane, and ammonia. The planet has always looked like this. Neptune. Probably formed closer to the sun. There may be an ocean of very hot water beneath Neptune's cold clouds. It doesn't boil away because the incredibly high pressure keeps it inside. Neptune is the windiest world in our solar system. Despite its great distance and low energy input from the sun, winds on Neptune can be three times stronger than on Jupiter and nine times stronger than on Earth. The appearance of the planet is affected by the appearance and disappearance of hurricanes. Sun. According to scientific research, the sun was about 30% dimmer when the Earth formed 4.5 billion years ago. Over time, it has shown more and more brilliantly due to the nuclear fusion process that takes place roughly 5 billion years from now. The original faint sun should have led to disaster here on Earth, but a thicker atmosphere on the early Earth might have been able to trap more heat, keeping the planet warm enough to support liquid water. We finally know when Earth will cease to exist. It'll happen when the sun enters its red giant phase. Are we going to survive long enough to witness it all? Let's figure it out. In 5.4 billion years from now, our star, which is a yellow dwarf at the moment, will run out of hydrogen in its core. The sun's core will heat up and become denser, causing the star to grow in size and turn into a red giant. The expanding sun will get so huge that it'll encompass the orbits of Mercury, Venus, and probably Earth. Even if our planet survived being consumed on the spot, it'd still end up so close to the heat of the newly born red giant that it'd scorch our planet. 
no life would be able to survive there. At the same time, there might be another outcome. As the sun expands, Earth's orbit might change, too. You see, when our star reaches the final stages of its stellar transformation, it will lose unimaginable amounts of mass through extremely powerful stellar winds. It'll keep growing and losing mass, making the planets of the solar system spiral outward. So can it help Earth escape its dooming grasp? According to astronomers' calculations, our planet will not survive the expansion of the sun in any case. By the time our star reaches its largest radius, which is going to be 256 times its current size, it'll be down to a mere 67% of the mass it has now. And the expansion process will be very rapid. The sun will sweep through the inner solar system in only 5 million years. At one point, it'll enter a short helium burning phase, which will last around 130 million years. During this time, it will expand beyond the orbit of Mercury. After that, the Sun will swallow Venus. By the time our star approaches Earth, it will be already losing as much as 8% of Earth's mass every year. Speaking of our planet's chances, we've got some kind of a good news, bad news situation on our hands. The bad news is that our planet won't be able to live through the expansion of the star. Even if Earth's orbit became 50% more distant from the Sun than it is today, it'd still have no chance. The Sun would engulf our planet even before reaching the peak of its red giant phase. After that, the star would still have half a million years and 0.25 AU to grow. Once Earth is inside the Sun's atmosphere, it will start colliding with particles of gas. Its orbit will begin to decay and the planet will spiral inward. If Earth was just a bit farther from the Sun right now, at 1.15 AU, it would survive the expansion phase of our star. But what can be considered good news in such a tragic situation? Well, long before the Sun enters this red giant phase, the habitable zone around it will be gone. The heat from the Sun will evaporate Earth's oceans, and solar radiation will blast away the hydrogen from the water. Devoid of its main source of life, Earth will eventually become molten. It doesn't sound like good news, that's true. But the upside of this situation is that humanity will be bound to leave our planet long before it gets swallowed by the sun. We just won't have a choice. Of course, we can't be sure that some other catastrophic event won't claim us before we have time to colonize some other world. An additional benefit of the changing boundaries of the Sun's habitable zone might be the restructuring of the entire solar system. Even though Earth won't be in our star's habitable zone anymore, most of the outer solar system will be. This zone will stretch well into the Kuiper Belt, which means that the formerly icy worlds will melt and liquid water will appear beyond the orbit of Pluto. So maybe that's where our new home will lie. Imagine humankind effectively colonizing the Red Planet. And you're one of the first people to brave this challenging journey. During the long, long flight, you entertain yourself with the thoughts of landing on Mars, getting a nice piece of land, building a house. Wait, wait, wait. The problem is you can't own anything in space. Broadly speaking, no one can own space. But this issue becomes more complex than that once you start looking into the particulars. Space is governed by a special agreement called the Outer Space Treaty. According to this treaty, outer space, including the moon and other celestial bodies, can't be subject to national appropriation, even by means of use or occupation. In other words, no nation can declare itself the owner of any part of space. So, that piece of land on Mars can't be yours. Space is declared to be the province of all humankind. But the contents in space are a different matter. For example, you might have a right to occupy a certain orbit. It means that you can place and keep your satellite in that orbital slot. Plus, when a nation registers its space object, it gets the right to exercise exclusive control over it. So, if one country built a moon base on the surface of Earth's natural satellite, this base would belong to this nation. But no one would be able to claim ownership over the land this moon station would stand on. But then, how about asteroid mining? Asteroids are rich in minerals, in particular, such metals as iron, nickel, gold, 
platinum, magnesium, palladium, and many others. According to NASA estimates, the value of asteroids that we could potentially exploit for resources could be worth as much as 700 quintillion dollars. And a quintillion is a number with 18 zeros. Who would be the owner of all that wealth? Well, the Moon Agreement obliges the participants to establish special procedures to control the exploitation of the natural resources of the Moon and other space bodies. But so far, it's still a bit unclear what rules this process will follow. In total, there are five international treaties related to space law. They're all overseen by the United Nations Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, on Copuos. You've already heard of the Outer Space Treaty. It's the foundation of international space law, and here are its principles for space exploration and operation. First of all, space activities should benefit all nations. Any country can actually explore orbit and beyond. There can be no claim for sovereignty in space. No dangerous weapons are allowed in orbit and beyond. The moon, the other planets of our solar system, and other celestial bodies can be used solely for peaceful purposes. Any astronaut from any country is considered an envoy of humanity, and all other nations that are the participants in the treaty have to provide them with all possible help when needed. It includes an emergency landing in a foreign country or at sea. Also, each of the countries that signed the agreement is in charge of its space activities and must provide constant supervision. And finally, nations are responsible for damage caused by their satellites and other space objects and must prevent space contamination. Now, even though nations can't lay claim to space and its resources, are there any constrictions determining who can keep stuff from space that landed on our planet? For example, in July 2022, space debris from SpaceX fell in a farmer's backyard in the snowy mountains. If this is the case, space junk must be returned to the country where it came from. But what if it was a meteorite carrying potentially valuable minerals? Specialists say that if this space traveler lands in your own backyard, as opposed to the property you rent, then you become the owner of this meteorite. But if you find the same meteorite on public land, you won't be able to keep it because meteorites are classified as protected objects under the Protection of Movable Cultural Heritage Act, 1986. People have always been intrigued by the question of how the world could end. Many theories have been suggested, many ideas debunked, and now, in the age of science, rather dire predictions come from physics and math. For example, let's take the theory of the Big Rip. It claims that one day, the pull of the expansion of the universe may grow stronger than the force of gravity. The resulting catastrophe will tear apart everything in space, even terrifying black holes. After that, there will be just clouds of single, disconnected particles floating all over the universe. Before this happens, please subscribe to our channel and like this video. Your support is very important to us. Thank you. And now, let's go into detail about this blood-chilling scenario. The cosmological model of the Big Rip is based on the idea that if the universe keeps accelerating in its expansion, it will one day reach the point where all the forces holding it together will be overcome by dark energy. Now let me explain. Everything on Earth and everything people have ever seen in space with the help of telescopes and other instruments is normal matter. It's made up of atoms and molecules and adds up to less than 5% of the universe. Around 68% of the universe is dark energy. Astronomers wouldn't even know the thing existed if, several decades ago, they hadn't found out that the expansion of the universe wasn't slowing down. Quite the opposite. It was accelerating. It meant that there had to be some enigmatic force that counteracted gravity. This force was later called dark energy. You might ask, but what about the remaining 27% of the universe? That's what we call dark matter. And it's another thing that confuses astronomers to no end. If dark energy is a force responsible for the expansion of the universe, Invisible dark matter is responsible for the way galaxies are organized on grand scales. 
It is also supposed to explain how objects work together. Potential candidates for dark matter vary from strange particles to super dim objects. If one day the power of dark energy becomes stronger than gravitational, electromagnetic, and weak nuclear forces, the universe is very likely to simply come apart. One of the newest models of the Big Rip theory was published in 2015, and in it, the date when the universe might meet its demise is specified. It's about 22 billion years from now. This hypothesis also says that as the expansion of the universe becomes infinite, its viscosity will decrease. Cosmological viscosity measures how resistant the universe is to expanding and contracting. Eventually, such changes will cause the destruction of the universe. The big rip will happen when dark energy overpowers gravity. At one point, it might become so strong that it will start ripping apart atoms. In other words, if the big rip theory is correct, one day, the world might come to the point where galaxies, stars, planets, and everything on them will be literally torn apart. This view might turn out to be really spectacular if there was anyone left to marvel at it. Powerful forces will break apart atoms and molecules, Electrons will split from atoms all the way down to quarks or even smaller pieces we don't know about yet. And then, everything will cease to exist. The Big Rip isn't the only scary theory about what the end of our universe might look like. Another popular hypothesis is the Big Crunch. It says that one day, the growth of the universe will slow down to a crawl, and then gravity will become the main force It'll make the universe shrink, causing planets, stars, and galaxies to collide with one another. It'll be the Big Bang in reverse, with everything collapsing in on itself. And let's not forget about another creepy scenario, the Big Freeze. The universe is expanding faster and faster. One day, this growth will pull previously visible galaxies too far away, and we won't see them ever again. Many billions of years later, the universe will turn into a huge, dark, empty, an incredibly cold place with no movement at all. Solar activity is approaching its peak, and it might be as dangerous as it sounds. Scientists think it's likely to begin by the end of the year 2023, and that's years before it was predicted to start. From a distance, the sun seems to be calm and steady. But if you zoom in, you'll see that its surface is constantly seething and churning. It keeps transforming from a uniform ocean of fire to a chaos of warped plasma and back again in a repeating cycle. Every 11 years or so, the magnetic field of our star gets tangled up. Imagine a ball of tightly wound rubber bands. That's what it looks like at such moments. And then, at one point, it snaps and flips completely, turning the North Pole into the South Pole and vice versa. Right before this event, the sun steps up its activity. It starts to spit out giant blobs of fiery plasma, emit powerful streams of radiation, and grow planet-sized spots. This period is known as solar maximum. It's a rather dangerous time for Earth since it gets regularly hit by solar storms. Such storms have the potential to disrupt communications and damage power infrastructure. Even worse, solar storms can harm astronauts working in space and even make satellites crash into the planet. At first, experts were sure that the current solar cycle would reach its peak in 2025. But judging by recent numerous sunspots, intense solar storms, and some other rare solar phenomena, solar maximum is likely to arrive as early as the end of this year. At the same time, most forecasts predict that the current cycle might peak in late 2024, it's still one year earlier than NASA and NOAA had expected. During this maximum, around 185 sunspots will appear every month. But that's not too bad. Such a cycle is considered quite average compared to the historical record. The current cycle, which is the 25th since people started to record them in 1755, began in 2019 and was supposed to be really mild. You see, solar cycles vary in intensity. The weakest ones on record produced fewer than 100 spots per month during their peaks, and the strongest could produce more than 300. Why do the latest estimates differ so much from the initial ones, though? 
The thing is, it's still pretty difficult to forecast solar cycles. Plus, don't forget that we only have 25 cycles on record. It means the amount of data available for computer modeling is quite limited. These days, researchers explore alternative ways of predicting the behavior of the sun. They're based on the star's magnetic activity. Scientists have found out that the strength of every next solar cycle depends on the time when the magnetic field of the previous cycle vanishes completely. This event is known as the Terminator. The Terminator doesn't happen exactly at the solar minimum. No, it might still be up to two years till the next solar cycle starts to stir, waking up slowly. At the solar minimum, the magnetic field of our star is powerful and well-organized. There are two distinct poles, like the ones a regular dipole magnet has. This magnetic field contains the sun's superheated plasma close to the surface, suppressing solar activity. But at one point, the magnetic field starts getting tangled again. Some regions become more magnetized than others. With time, the sun's magnetic field weakens. Solar activity starts to increase. Plasma rises from the surface of the star, forming giant magnetized coronal loops, peppering the sun's lower atmosphere. These horseshoe-shaped fiery ribbons then snap when the magnetic field realigns, releasing bright flashes of radiation and light. Those are solar flares. These flares often bring about huge magnetized clouds of fast-moving particles, coronal mass ejections. A few years after the solar maximum, the sun's magnetic field flips. That's the end of the solar cycle and the beginning of a new solar minimum. There are eight planets in our solar system and they're all very different from one another. That's why, if one day, they unexpectedly and inexplicably turned into humans, these people wouldn't look alike and their characters would differ dramatically. Let's try to imagine what humans the planets of the solar system would make. Do you like our videos? Write about it in the comments and please subscribe to our channel. Let me introduce Mercury. It's a curious and swift teenager around 13. 15 years old. He's always on the move and is a bit hard to pin down. He's into sports and tends not to walk but dash around. That's one of the reasons his knees and elbows are always scratched. He's just like the planet Mercury with all its countless craters. Now, meet Venus. It's a beautiful young lady in her mid-twenties. She likes to keep her secrets, and her alluring beauty comes with a temperamental side. At parties, she easily attracts attention because of the mystery surrounding her. But those who dare strike up a conversation with this beauty soon realize that she's scorchingly direct and doesn't tolerate nonsense. Earth is in her late twenties. She is very pretty and extroverted, and has a nurturing, balanced personality. Forever the peacemaker, trying to maintain harmony. Earth is the one everyone turns to for advice and comfort. She has a pretty unusual hobby, collecting different life forms, like someone who always brings home stray animals. And if she feels that something or someone is a threat to her beloved pets, she can get furious. Mars is a cool guy in his early 20s. He's ginger and sturdy. He's that ambitious and a bit annoying younger brother living in Earth's shadow. But he doesn't give up and is determined to make a name for himself. He's a great fan of adventure and exploration, that very type who enjoys camping, wilderness, and slightly dangerous activities. His guilty pleasure is Googling stories about ancient warriors. Jupiter is in his early 50s. He is that protective elder with a bigger-than-life personality. He is a respected head of a large family, known for his wisdom and jovial nature. He also loves to throw big parties that sometimes get out of hand. Saturn, an elegant lady in her late forties, is stylish and timeless. She is always the best dressed person at any gathering. She's known for her beauty and has a calm, sophisticated demeanor. She loves accessories, especially elaborate rings. She's got quite a collection. Uranus is in his late thirties and he has an unconventional, quirky personality. If you have a problem and need a different perspective on something, he's the one to go to. No wonder his planet counterpart has a unique axial tilt. Uranus isn't afraid to be different. He enjoys innovative and boundaries-pushing art, and some suspect he might be a hacker. Neptune is a thoughtful man in his early 40s, 
He's kind of a dreamer and probably the most creative one in the group. You can often find him lost in thought or swept away by music. He's almost always wearing his large blue headphones. He's very sensitive and has a high emotional intelligence. This quality draws others in. That's not all. Let's look at a space body that used to be a planet, Pluto. It's a very young teenager, quiet and often overlooked. But he has a surprising amount of depth. Despite his introverted nature, he has a group of close-knit friends. It might take time to get to know him, but those who gain his trust discover his different side, endearing and witty. The son is a big boss. No one knows how old he is because he looks ageless. Rumor has it he frequents beauty clinics, but shh. The son knows his worth and uniqueness. He's quite caring and nice to his subordinates, but he's also rather hot-tempered. And when he gets angry, he expresses his displeasure openly, often by throwing stuff. The Moon is a shy 18-year-old girl. It's hard for her to make new friends. She prefers to keep close to the only friend she has, which is Earth. To her, Earth is a motherly figure who can protect and give valuable advice. The Moon has some skin problems, which also makes her feel rather insecure. But don't worry, Earth is working on her confidence. Now, it's been a long time since there was a supernova in the Milky Way. Over 400 years, to be precise. So hey, we're long overdue. So here are the most likely stars to go boom, if they haven't already. At the top of the list must be the Southern Hemisphere's star, Eta Carini. Greek letters before the name of the constellation indicate the rank of the star's brightness in that constellation. Sir Edmund Halley, in 1677, recorded Eta Carini as the seventh brightest star in the constellation Carina, Eta being the seventh letter in the Greek alphabet. It might not have looked very bright to Sir Edmund and his contemporaries in the 17th century, but modern studies of Eta Carini estimate it's 5 million times more luminous than our Sun. Luminous is a technical word astronomers use. It doesn't just mean brightness. Luminosity refers to the total energy released at all frequencies. Eta Carinae releases 5 million times more energy than the Sun. Truly one of the whoppers of the Milky Way, Eta Carinae is 100 times more massive and 240 times larger than our yellow-white dwarf sun, Sol. Obviously, since it appears dim, Eta Carinae is pretty far away, about 7,500 light-years away. Yet even at this distance, if this star goes hypernova, it can still impact Earth's ozone layer, disrupt satellite communications, and harm astronauts. 159 years after Halley's observation, Eta Carinae experienced a nova-like explosion. It increased from a relatively dim star to become the second brightest star visible from Earth, but only for a period of 27 years. From 1836 until 1863, Eta Carinae was the second brightest visible star after Sirius 